I used to be a duty manager at a 250 bed hotel in the UK. It was built on the seafront in 1828. I would often sit with the girls on the front desk in the evenings if I wasn't busy, mostly because they were nice, and also because the place, despite being beautiful, was creepy as hell at night. The elevator would often ding, open up, and go up and down and stop by itself. It was always perfect when the engineer came to look at it, though. There were often reports from guests that a dog was running in the halls, always the same description, and it would disappear. Someone came down from their room, telling us a man was there, and we had to send someone up to make sure. They switched rooms. New waiting staff would often approach a woman in the dining hall, looking out to see, for her to disappear before they got to her. Part of my job was to do the security slash fire checks. I had to tour the building's dark basements with a flashlight. In the basement, there are arched rooms that were once used for storage limits, cleaning materials and foods. They looked like empty little prison cells now. Luckily, the maintenance men would escort me around most nights. It was spooky. Almost every night, I like to go into my basement for a night of playing video games with my friends. Normally, the night goes well, and I'm in bed by one. But recently, I have been hearing sounds in my basement, such as what I believe to be coughing, and sometimes snoring. When I hear this, I immediately go up to my room and sleep until the morning. When I go back down to my computer. I am sometimes greeted with odd websites that I have never visited, and my initial thought was that I had a virus. I did a virus scan and found nothing. When this happened again three times over the course of two weeks, I completely wiped my hard drive of everything. And when I woke up in the morning, Google Chrome had been installed to my computer, and thirty tabs were open to various websites. But the strangest one. Was the FedEx website telling me my package had been shipped? I didn't look where, but I regret it now. Almost three months had gone by, and I hadn't thought much about the situation other than the odd sounds. And I asked my friend to go into the basement to get something for me. I was surprised when he ran up the stairs as fast as he could, and what he said he saw next. Was enough to prompt me to call the police. He said he saw someone crawling out of the window well by the time he got down there, and all he saw was that person's legs. We ran outside to look for them, but there were no signs of them anywhere. We both assumed that they had gone into the woods about fifty feet from my house. When the police came, they found nothing out of the ordinary. The police left, and my friend left fifteen minutes later, understandably frightened by what he had just seen. For the next two months, I still heard these sounds and experienced scary and strange occurrences, like my downstairs shower being wet when nobody had used it beforehand. And one day, they all stopped, and I had a note on my desk written in Sharpie that said "Thanks for the stay," and that was the end of the situation. For the longest time, I thought the note was part of an elaborate prank, but now I'm not so sure. With all the other stuff that's happened between all of that, and the fact that my family had all been asleep during these encounters to this day, I still have no idea who that person is, and don't really care to find out. This story is from when I was a teenager, and just started high school. My friends and I lived in a town that, at the time, had a lot of farmland. Near my house, a mall had recently been made, so my friends and I tried to ride our bikes to go shopping one day. We missed our turn, and instead, 
wound up on a long road with a small downhill slope that ran through some farmland. Having never been to the mall before, and never having been down this road, we assumed it would lead us to the mall. Instead, this road twisted and turned through thicker and thicker woodland after the farmland ended. At the end of the road, there was an abandoned old house that was visibly falling apart. My friends and I simply turned around and found our way to the mall that day. But we ended up coming back time and time again because the road was long and had just enough of a slope to make your bike go faster than you could pedal. One day, we ended up daring each other to go into the house. Up until this point, we had never gone into it. My friends dared me to go in because I was pretty confident it would be safe if I was careful. So I did. It was a pretty empty house with some old moldy furniture. There were holes in a lot of the floor space. One Halloween's Eve, we went back to the house to play hide and seek for giggles. We brought a few other of our friends as it was going to be a pretty fun time, or so we thought. At first, everything went all right. We played a few rounds and some of the girls were sneaking away with their boyfriends off to the woods to make out, but we kept playing. Eventually, I went into the building to hide again and noticed that while there was a ladder up to the attic, there was a hole I could climb through that led to a more secluded spot of the attic where I couldn't be seen as easily. I thought to myself, this is the perfect hiding spot and climbed onto it. I had brought a flashlight, so I turned it on, but kept the light on low to the floor in order not to give away my position outside. I started looking around when I noticed a flash. It was the reflection from a pair of Nike shoes. Someone was already up here. I raised the light to see who else was already up here, but it wasn't one of my friends. He was dressed in torn up clothing. I only held the light over him for a second before noping out of the attic. It took me about three seconds to squeeze back through the hole, but the guy stood still, not even acknowledging that I had ever been near him. I told my friends, and we all decided to stop playing and go outside to look at the attic, as part of me was exposed by a hole on the side of the roof, and there was a window that the guy was standing near. Nobody could see him through the hole, so we went to look at the window. We saw a guy with a crazed look in his eyes, and we just bolted. One of us told their parents, and they called the police. The police did not find the person. However, what they did find makes me glad I got out of there as soon as I did. The police found seven fingers with three being the right index finger and a human head mounted on the windowsill of the attic. We weren't looking at the guy I had seen. We were looking at a corpse. Apparently that house was being used by a gang and it was so out of the way and unimportant that nobody ever went to it aside from us. What's more, they found a machete on a tarp where I had seen the guy and several traps inside the house meant to catch intruders if they tried to sneak into the attic through the ladder. So, guy in the empty house, let's not meet. I work night shifts at an airport, cleaning planes for different airlines. I recently got the pass to start cleaning for a second airline. I never had any issues until I started working on these two planes. I clean the same group of planes every night, 
as they stay at my airport overnight. Well, while working on one of these two planes for Airline 2, I noticed someone walk down the aisle behind me. I thought it was my co-workers leaving me to clean the plane alone. But when I looked around, my co-workers were on the opposite end of the plane still working. This happens every night I work, pretty much. I see people walk behind me, or hear footsteps, and when I look around, there's no one there. Not really a big deal, but it's all I got. Seeing as I don't believe in ghosts, but it's something that's been bothering me. So next time you're on a plane, be careful. It might be haunted. I went to a fairly large middle school that had kids from at least three cities in the area all going to it. From there, I went to a small high school with maybe 300 kids in total. My high school was a highly competitive charter school located in the mountains and surrounded by several acres of woods. I met this guy, Sam, in middle school, but didn't really interact with him much. It was more of one of those friend of my friends things. Fast forward to my sophomore year of high school, Sam transfers into my high school, and my high school did some block schedules. So we had four classes and a sort of study hall slash homeroom class in the middle of the day. Sam transferred part way through sophomore year, and I didn't know how this happened, but he ended up in four out of my five classes, counting homeroom slash study hall. At this time, I had established a bit of a reputation at the school for being helpful and a good student. So when Sam transferred and seemed to be having a tough time, I was asked to take him under my wing and help him out. Boy, do I regret doing that. One of the classes we had together was a history class that I also had with one of my best friends. Despite her protests, my teacher made the two of us work with Sam on all our group projects. Sam was already kind of creepy with me, even though he has been at our school for less than a week. When we started working together, he would sit uncomfortably close to me, and at first he wouldn't say much. But as he got more and more courage, he began talking to me. At first, it was all normal stuff. I had an older boyfriend at the time, who was in the Air Force and stationed in Japan. I know that sounds like one of those lies high school girls make up to get creepy guys to back up, but this was true. We were childhood friends and had began dating shortly before he enlisted. So I made sure Sam knew I wasn't looking for anything more than a friend, but it didn't take long before he started flirting with me. His flirting quickly escalated from compliments to asking if my boyfriend Alex was real, to trying to steal the purity ring I wore every day on my finger, and joking that one day it wouldn't be just the ring he was stealing. I was freaked out, but I figured there wasn't much he could do since we only saw each other at school, and he didn't know where I lived. Back when I was in high school, the chat that's a part of Gmail now called Google Hangouts was like the AIM messenger of the time. So everyone used it, and there were several group chats that I was a part of for my school that used personal email addresses rather than our school Gmails. Through this, Sam got my email address. He started sending me creepy, explicit emails about the things he dreamt about. I won't share the one I have saved, but they were gross, especially to a Christian virgin girl. He often had some part about me moaning how I loved him, not Alex, over and over again. Eventually it got so bad 
that one of my friends reported what was happening to school administration. They basically sent out an email to the entire school administration that Sam wasn't allowed to communicate with me at school. This freed me from everything but the creepy emails that came in on a weekly basis, at least until the end of the year. Junior year, Sam was keeping his distance, but we had a class together, so we had started interacting at a minimal level. I mostly just ignored him and hung out with my friends though. Senior year is when things started getting really bad again and I didn't realise how bad they had actually been in my junior year until this point. We both took advanced martial arts as an elective class that year, which meant not only did we have to talk, we actually had to spar and train together. The worst thing about this is that my high school gym was a 3-5 to five minute walk from the rest of our campus, and you had to walk through a trail through the woods that I mentioned earlier, to get back there. Sam would wait for me every morning at the top of the trail before school, and at the bottom of the trail after class, just so that he could walk with me. Although he usually walked a good five feet behind me, and didn't talk to me. At this point, my long distance relationship was beginning to fall apart, and Sam saw this as his opportunity. He started telling me stuff about how I was his soulmate, and I just didn't want to see it. He also told me that he had drawn some kind of rune that eternally bound our souls. Don't ask me what that means. Sam was into all sorts of wicca, dreamwalking and other magic stuff that I wrote off as stupid jokes. As we came up on the end of our senior year, some of my teachers started asking me about essays short stories and poems that I had written and turned in during earlier years. I eventually found out that Sam had been taking my old writing out of the trash at the end of each year when I cleaned out my locker and thrown out all those old assignments I no longer cared about and was turning them back in as his own work. I insisted I knew nothing about it and my school decided to search his locker. The thing was like a crazy shrine to me. He had piles of my old homework and assignments that I had thrown out, and four or five composition notebooks that I used to keep as diaries and poetry journals that I assumed I had just lost at some point. The school assumed he was simply keeping my work in hopes of turning it back in and getting better grades so that he could actually graduate, but it felt really creepy to me. The school took all of my old work and made me take it home and suggested I not throw out assignments away at school or I would get into trouble for letting him copy me. The thing is, the other thing they found in his locker that they didn't care about, but I did, was several word magnets that my friend and I had made to leave notes in each other's lockers. I know they were the ones out of my locker which meant he also knew my combination. A few weeks after they raided his locker, I was getting changed back into my regular clothes after my martial arts class, and discovered that my bra and my extra workout shirt were missing from my locker. I reported it to the school, but nothing ever came of that. I'm fairly sure Sam stole them, but I've never been able to prove it. After that, he stopped talking to me for the most part. I had a new boyfriend who actually went to our school for the last two months of senior year, and Sam was terrified of him. The only thing that happened was that one of the composition notebooks I had completely filled with quotes and poems went missing, and occasionally the magnets and other things in my locker seemed to magically rearrange themselves in ways that didn't make sense. Some of my friends knew my combination, and although they swore they'd never touch my stuff, I just figured it was them trying to be funny. After graduation, I figured that I was finally free of Sam, but instead, he began to stalk me more closely. 
At first, it was just emails from accounts I didn't recognize, asking for things that didn't make sense. I marked these as spam and ignored them. Then he made an account, under the same name of one of my former friends from high school. I thought it was actually my friend Becca emailing me, so I responded. We carried on a pretty normal email conversation for a few weeks, and then she got weird. She and I had talked about our relationship and things like that, so she knew I had a boyfriend. She started asking me to send her nudes, and insisting that if I didn't, she would hurt herself or try to end her life. She used to send me pictures of the deep cuts on her arm, or even counted the pills she took when I refused to do what she asked. Becca had told me she was living somewhere in Colorado, so I was pretty sure I couldn't call anyone and say someone I knew was threatening to do what they were doing. I'm not proud of what I did, or that I fell for Sam's games, but I did what I was told for fear of being responsible for someone's death. This went on for several months, until I finally got tired of it and actually deleted my email address. Things were quiet from there as I started my first year of college. However, I soon found out from a friend of mine that Sam was attending the community college, which is within walking distance of the one I was attending. I didn't think Sam knew where I was, so I figured I'd be fine, and I was for about the first month. Sam started showing up outside my classes. At first, he would just stand there in the sea of people leaving my class until he knew I saw him. Then he would walk away. This started to really freak me out. And at the time, I had no friends at the college and no boyfriend to intimidate Sam. After a few weeks, I started getting emails to my college email address. They always came from different email addresses and had no subject, and always had four attachments. They were always me somewhere on campus, eating, in class, heading to class, heading to my car, even photos of me heading into the bathroom. I reported everything to campus police, but they told me that unless I could prove who was doing this, there wasn't much they could do about it. I established the habit of getting on and off campus as quickly as possible, and not talking or interacting with anyone. After my first semester and Christmas break, things calmed back down for a while, and I started trying to make friends, which turned out to be a big mistake. I had started working in a store in my local mall, and I hadn't heard from Sam, or Becca, in several months. Sam started showing up at my work that January. I worked in a home decor store, so the store had pretty narrow walkways between the displays, and it was next to impossible to notice someone coming up behind you, and the cameras in half the store were dead. At first, he would just wander around, and if I was working, he might do something, like break something in my section of the store. One of my co-workers actually saw him do it a few times. I worked on a rotating schedule, so I worked different times and different days every week. So he couldn't just wait for me to show up. If he went to the store and I wasn't there, he would ask when I was working claiming to be my boyfriend. After two or three times of my managers and co-workers asking me why my boyfriend had come in asking for my schedule, did I find out it was Sam? I explained the situation to my managers, and they let everyone know that if Sam showed up while I was working, they had to alert the manager and me, so that I could stay in the back. They were also told to tell Sam that I no longer worked there, in hopes that he would stop. It took my manager threatening to call more security for him to finally stop coming to my work. After that, he went quiet again for almost a year, before popping up on my social media again last year. He claimed that he had changed, and that he wanted a second chance. Me, being the stupid person that I am, and always wanting to give people the benefit of the doubt, 
and only seeing the best in people, started to rebuild a friendship with him. At this point, I was actually single, but was trying to build a friendship with this guy that I had a thing for for a very long time, who was now my fiance. It was only a week into us talking before he started being creepy again and begging for nudes and sending me messages like the emails he used to send me in high school. My now fiance, then my best friend, although he asked me out within a few weeks of this, signed into my account on Snapchat and basically ranted at this guy telling him to leave his girlfriend alone and the next inappropriate message he sent me would mean my boyfriend immediately blocked his account and he would never speak to me again. After that, I tried to put some distance between us, although I tried to be friendly and answer when he talked to me. After a few months of this, Becca made a reappearance. She started talking to me on Instagram as someone completely different. We spoke for a few weeks before she started sending me messages that made it clear it really was Sam. My fiancé and I have a theory that Sam decided to bring Becca back as a way to attempt to make me dependent on Sam again. She went back to her old tricks of the self-harm and the threats. Except this time, Sam used the timed photo thing on Instagram and his little sister to really add a punch to it to make me truly believe she was trying to hurt herself. I told her that I knew who she was and that she was lying. She threatened to blackmail me with old images I had sent her way back in my first year of college if I didn't send her more. Instead, I told my boyfriend and he used his tech nerdiness to check out the metadata on her photos and discovered that they were screenshots from some other account and that this person actually lived in the same state as us. We reported Becca to both Instagram and our local police and spoke to a lawyer friend of mine about the things she said, and then blocked both Becca and Sam. The only thing that's happened since then is that a few accounts have popped up on Facebook and whisper using my images, both the appropriate and explicit ones, and claiming to be me. My fiance has a search algorithm set up to find them. Although as soon as one comes up, it's down before either of us get a chance to report it. It doesn't happen consistently, and entire months go by between incidences. But honestly, I wish it would just stop already. Sam, please, leave me alone, and let's never meet again. I am a woman that works night audit at a small hotel property in a small ass town. I'm used to working alone, and it takes quite a bit to scare me or freak me out. I have dealt with domestic disturbances, hostile homeless men twice my size, and helped get rid of the prostitution problem on our property over two years ago. So when I say that this man really creeped me the hell out, know that it means a lot. Let's start from the beginning. What is it with this week? Every night has been some other dumpster fire for me to put out. But oh boy, does tonight's particular creeper take the cake. So I'm sitting at the desk browsing Reddit as you do, when a guest heads my way from the first floor rooms. I don't think much of it. He gets up to me and picks up a brochure from our rewards program and starts asking me about it. It's legit my job to answer these questions. So he starts his questions standing catty corner to me and ends up right in front of me. He says thanks and leaves. Was he kind of awkward? Yes, but not anything I haven't dealt with before. Five to ten minutes pass and here he comes again this time saying that a friend of his is supposed to come and collect him and wants to know if anyone has come by asking for him. I tell him no, and that no one has been here in a while. Honestly, this was my first mistake, but hindsight and all that. 
He paces back and forth in the lobby for a few minutes, before asking if he can stand to the side of the front desk, almost right next to me, as something was wrong with his neck and he couldn't see out of the door properly. This was the second red flag, because there was a couch directly in front of me that had a section that if you just sat there you could face the door slash parking lot, but apparently I lost my mind tonight. I reply with, I guess, and he stands there and starts asking questions about his room, saying that he was supposed to be transferring to a suite tomorrow, and we are an all suites property. I say I didn't know anything about that, but asked for his last name to check, but he wouldn't tell me. He kept mouthing something at me, and then whispering something just barely audible. It really seemed to me that he wanted me to lean in to hear what he was saying, but there was no way I was going to do that. By this point I was already uncomfortable, and just stared at him, telling him several times that I am hard of hearing and that he will need to speak up. When that didn't work, I asked him for his room number so that I could look it up that way, and he said he couldn't remember. Okay. I asked what floor he's on. He said he didn't know. Now I watched him come from the first floor rooms, and I knew he was staying down there. I just wasn't sure which room he was in. So now I know that for some reason he doesn't want me to know which room he's staying in, and for some reason this makes me start to feel very unsafe. He finally gives me the last name, Johnson, and I tell him we have no one here under that name. He says, oh, maybe it's under my boss's name, but I can't give a name for that either. He then says maybe it's under his company name but told me he works for the highway patrol, for a small mechanic shop called Joe Dirt Mechanics, and that he works general construction under a contractor whose name he doesn't know. While he tells me all this, he keeps doing that weird whisper to trying to get me to lean closer to him, but my brain is flashing red neon warning signs and screaming, danger, danger as loudly as possible, so I print a random piece of paper off the computer and tell him I need to step into the back office to make some copies. He seems to take the hint, and heads back down the hallway leaving me free to freak out in the back room, but also free to grab my pepper spray. As I walk back out, I realize that instead of actually leaving, he just moved around the corner out of sight to wait for me to come back to the desk. I feel better armed with my pepper spray, and I'm ready to haul ass and lock myself in the back office if he tries anything. This time he doesn't stay long, just asks about the restaurant that he can see out the window slash door. He wants to know if he would be safe walking down there by himself. I tell him it would be fine, and that I walk down there myself all the time, and have never had any problems. He angles for a ride a little bit, but I lied on this one and told him I didn't have a car. He leaves, and heads down to this restaurant, while I'm just glad this seems to be over. He's gone for 15 minutes, when he returns carrying a cup from the restaurant, saying he didn't like the food there. I tell him that's too bad, and make myself look busy with paperwork. He seems to take the hint, and leaves again. By this point, every interaction with him has left me feeling more creeped out and unsafe than the last, and I start texting my husband to let him know what was going on. The next slash last time I saw him last night, I heard him coming down the hall because he was on the phone, and when I looked up he was staring at me really intently, so I gathered some papers and went into the back office to avoid him. I heard him pass the desk and go out the doors, so I peeked into my manager's office to see him standing at her window, 
peering in trying to see me from there. I called my husband at that point and told him to get his ass up here because I couldn't do this anymore. As I'm on the phone, I get the courage to peek back around the corner to the manager's office that he was peeping into and notice he is gone and told my husband to be on the lookout for this guy walking outside of the hotel or between the hotel and the restaurant. I look out the window and didn't see him anywhere but go back in hiding just in case. My husband comes flying into the parking lot and comes in to find me hiding in the back telling me that he looked everywhere and couldn't see anyone. Within a minute, this creepy guy comes in the front door trying to talk to me over my husband. But after a very murderous look from my wonderful man, he booked it out the lobby and didn't return for the rest of the night. I had my husband stay to play security guard just in case anything came of it, but nothing did until the morning when the housekeeper filling in for regular breakfast attendant let me know that the same guy was around yesterday morning and was denied a room by our manager for creeping out the housekeeper. The manager even had to go with her to take out the trash because this guy was so unsettling. Apparently he came back after the manager left for the day and got a room from the one man on the front desk star. My apartment is haunted. I'm 20 years old and live in a fairly small apartment complex. I live here with my husband and two year old daughter. We've lived here for about a year and a half and the weird stuff started about eight months ago. In my apartment, there are two bedrooms and in my daughter's room, there is a utility closet and a regular sliding door closet. In my room, one whole wall is basically a closet with three sliding doors. You may be wondering why I'm explaining closets. Well, this is because that's where all the creepiness started. One huge OCD tick of mine is closing doors. I cannot stand doors being open for no reason. So every door in my home is shut almost 24 seven. Or so I thought. One day while I was visiting my cousin, who lives one apartment building over from me, for an all day occasion, my daughter was gone with family for the weekend and my husband was at work. Some odd stuff happened. My husband made it home first and only went in for about five minutes to grab something out the kitchen and bring it over to my cousin's place. He verified that I indeed had closed every door while he got home. After sitting around and chatting with my cousin for a few more hours, we went home. Walking through my front door, I felt like something was off. It was pitch black, but I chalked it up to my husband shutting off the stove light, which in itself is still odd. Stumbling for the light switch, we find one of my daughter's toys placed in front of the light switch, where in the dark, you could easily trip over it. This was sign too that something was off. I knew for a fact that it hadn't been there where I'd left earlier. I brushed it off and continued on getting settled in for the night. Later, while walking down the hall, I stopped dead in my tracks. One third of the way down the hall, when I saw my daughter's bedroom door slightly ajar. Had my husband been in there? I could have sworn he was in the living room the entire time. But then I heard it. The closet door. Her closet door. In the pitch black of her room. Had slammed open. I stood frozen for a moment before slowly peeking around the corner of her door frame. Nothing. The door was closed, but something else catches my attention. Out of the corner of my eye, I see it. A small light. A flashlight that had previously been in the bottom drawer of the kitchen. It sat in the center of my daughter's bed with the light illuminating the corner behind her bed. I approached it slowly and the moment my hand connected with the light, a button operated toy began flashing behind me. You heard that right. This toy 
that you have to manually press buttons onto to turn on was flashing while I was cornered in my daughter's room. I felt my heart was just about to force its way up my throat. I couldn't breathe until, like a hero out of a movie, my husband walked in asking what I was doing and I left the room quickly. A few nights later, my daughter is still out with family and me and my husband are in bed. It's the middle of the night and I'm having the weirdest dream. I dream that I'm lying awake in bed and there is a dark shape in the darkest corner of my room and it startles me awake, or so I think. I wake up in another dream with this tall dark figure bent over my bed staring down at me. This time I'm jolted awake and I'm trying to catch my breath. While I sit in this silent dark, my husband is sleeping and I'm essentially alone. That's when I hear it. My closet door is shaking back and forth on the track, not like being blown by wind, but like someone is shoving it trying to get out. At this point I'm in tears and shaking my husband awake, and the moment his eyes open it stops. I get frustrated and cry harder, because now I feel like I'm going crazy, but this entity obviously isn't done yet. Night after night of listening to toys coming on alone and closets opening and closing, does it finally happen? Now, I have this problem with my eyes called optic neuritis, which causes me to occasionally lose my eyesight when I stress out too much. The reason I tell you this is because the night my husband finally got to see what I was talking about was the night I lost my vision for a few days. We were in bed sometime at night, and it's quiet. I'm really good at detecting sound, since I'm basically blind every few months or so, when I hear a familiar click. I sat straight up in bed. Our hallway light is a twist light, so to turn it on you twist a little knob at the bottom, and it clicks when you twist it. At the same time, my husband jumps out of bed because he sees the hall light flash on through the crack of the door. I'm panicking, but I know that he is finally going to understand what I've been suffering through. He opens the door, and from what he told me, every door in the house was wide open. After a long night of closing doors and tear-filled apologies, we finally pass out from exhaustion. My daughter comes home and is acting strange, talking to walls, sitting in her closet, and pointing at corners. This scares me, but my husband says it's normal kid stuff. And before bed, my daughter and I are in the living room, and she's using her potty chair when she points into the kitchen and says, push it off. And within seconds, a glass is flung from the counter at the wall and lands upright on the floor. I'm traumatized living in my apartment. One thing more happened yesterday when me and a friend were sitting in the living room with my daughter and she gets up and runs to the open door. I assume my husband is home because before she gets there the doorknob starts turning like he's trying to unlock it. And the moment she unlocks it, the door starts to open but slams before she can pull it open. I'm confused at this point, and so is my friend, so I check the door and nobody is even near it. I live at the top of some stairs, so I'd hear someone running down the stairs if it was a joke. My daughter is visiting for holidays with family, and I'm alone. While I'm video chatting with my mother, she stops mid-sentence and says hi to my husband. I'm confused, and think that she can see the confusion on my face because she begins to look confused as well. I remind my mother that I'm alone, and she goes pale, explaining that she had just seen the shape of a person standing in the hall behind the couch where I was sitting. Moments later, after I walk through the house with an old pocket knife in hand, I find nothing. But now my mum and I, at the same time, ask, is that running water? I look around trying to find the source of the sound, checking every bathroom, not a drip. 
Then the sound sounds like it's coming from the kitchen. Nothing again. Frustrated, I stomp back to the bathroom and my skin begins to crawl. The sink is on full blast. How? Confused yet again, I walk back into the living room, phone still in hand, talking to my mother and the wall behind me that connects the living room and my daughter's room. There's a loud bang, like someone hit the apartment wall very hard. I spent an hour waiting outside my apartment on the phone with my mum, waiting for my husband to get home and survey it further before I entered. For context, my dad grew up with this man called Bruce and considered him one of his best friends. Bruce was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in his late teens and my dad, being the kind and caring soul that he is, stepped in to be his guardian. I say that lightly. I mean, he always helped Bruce out when he was going through an episode. Growing up, Bruce was always around. I saw him as another father figure in my life. He lived in a small town two hours away from my city, where we also had a holiday home. So he was constantly coming up to stay at ours. He was kind, calm, and patient, as well as being an amazing artist. Almost yearly, Bruce went through phases of refusing to take his medication. This then triggered an intense manic episode, some of which I have witnessed, and are frightening to see for a young child who only knew this person as quiet and calm. He would do and say things far beyond his control and couldn't quite grasp reality. And that unfortunately is where it begins. I was 12 years old when this happened. So it was around 10 years ago, but still feels fresh in my mind. Every summer, my family and I would take a trip down to our beach house, which was Bruce's town. Our little house was a one room unit where us kids would usually sleep in the lounge. But for Christmas, our parents brought a massive three person tent for us to sleep on the front lawn. So while my parents slept up in the house, we got the tent. A week before my dad had to drive back up for work, he got a strange call from Bruce. Although at the time, I didn't know what it was about. I could see the concerned look on my dad's face as he told Bruce, no, I won't do that. After further arguing, my dad hung up and murmured to my mum about something. I was sorted out and my dad left. I asked what was wrong because my mum's expression turned into worry. She shrugged it off and told me not to concern myself. And that was that. Later that night, I heard from my mum talking to my auntie that Bruce was refusing to take his medication unless my dad withdrew money. From what I know, my dad's in charge of Bruce's finances and his bank account because Bruce has a meth problem. Bruce has a son who is trying to stay clean from it. And after Bruce tried and failed to get his son to buy him some meth, he turned to my dad who also refused. I totally get it. He's an adult and can make his own choices, but my dad didn't want to enable his drug problem. My dad stepped in to being a guardian of Bruce so that's his job. This is where everything goes sour. Bruce started threatening to stop taking his medication ever again, and that he hadn't been for weeks. And then he started threatening to harm my brothers and I. He said to my parents, they trust me, it would be easy. My mum freaks out and tells him that she's calling the cops. The police arrived at his house to see the whole property was empty. He had fled and was hiding somewhere that made everyone uneasy. Nothing really happened in the next coming weeks. And it was time for my dad to drive back up to the city for work. 
Mum felt okay staying down with us. And of course, the three kids were oblivious to all the commotion that was going on. So, we were too. Everything is good for the first few nights. Dad's gone, and that's when it starts going downhill. It's around 3.30 a.m. My brothers and I are sound asleep in the tent. My mum, up in the house, is also fast asleep. When she wakes up to a booming of texts from Bruce, they're all blank. But since this is the first time hearing from Bruce since he threatened her kids, my mum is now wide awake and in full-blown panic mode. Bruce rings her and she answers. He doesn't reply instead breathes heavily on the phone for 10 seconds before hanging up. The second time is the same. Mum asks where he is, but he hangs up on her. He rings for the third time, saying, back deck, before hanging up. My mum hears a loud bang from the back of the house and quickly calls the police. The only way to the back of the house is by going through the front lawn where my brothers and I were sleeping. I don't remember much, except being shaken awake by my dad's best friend, who my mum called in tears, and coming into the house to see three police officers standing around. My brothers and I were now wide awake because we were curious as to everything going on. And then this happened. My dad came back down for us with the news. Bruce's son had come up to him in the city to apologize and confess that he was told to come to end the life of our family in exchange for a large sum of money. My dad was in shock and rushed back down. Bruce was back in hiding again. My mum let everyone who knew him and was close to him know what happened. And if he did come to them, was to let the police know who will immediately detain him as he was considered dangerous and mentally unstable. The crappiest thing was one of her supposedly best friends who knew him, let him stay at hers instead of calling the authorities. Side note, they have only started talking again recently after my mum forgave her. As the summer started to wind down, we returned to the city to find a few terrifying things. My mum and dad came home to one of their bathroom windows smashed and dirty footprints everywhere. For some reason, nothing out of the ordinary had happened until my older brother, an avid cockatiel lover, went out to check our Avery birds to find they were all missing. Not one was there, and we assumed they must have escaped and flown away until dad got a nasty surprise opening our barbecue to see that all 10 of them had been cooked alive. My parents can't prove it was him, but after all that has happened in regards to Bruce, it probably was, especially after finding out what mum's friend did. To make matters worse, our neighbor heard and saw what was going on when we were broken into, but didn't bother to ring the police or even let us and my parents know. We were furious. She made an awful excuse about being home alone and never having witnessed something like this. So, to Bruce, a man I knew was another father figure in my life. You may have bipolar disorder, and you can't help that. But after what you put my family and I through, I hope we never meet again. This story was told to me by my grandfather and told to him by his friend while he served in the Vietnam War. This is going to be told in the point of view of my grandfather's friend. Before I was drafted, I was working on a farm in Alabama. All my life I've been working on a farm with family and friends. We never had much money. So about 20 of us had to live in an old plantation house. On the property, there was an old barn where we kept the workhorses, one mule and a few hogs. Next to the woods were some old slave houses that some of our friends lived in. Every morning as the sun rose, we rose. For breakfast, we ate whatever was for dinner the night before. 
we didn't have time to sit and wait for food to be cooked. Us kids had to work with the women, so we mostly just picked whatever was being harvested that year. Basically, I'm telling you it was hard work. We always had strange things happen to us. We were pretty much in the middle of nowhere, and the only time we'd seen new faces were when we went to town in our wagon to sell our vegetables. We couldn't just call 911 because we didn't have a single telephone. We didn't even have lights. We used candles and lanterns. The little bit of money we had wouldn't pay for electricity. One winter night, we were all settled down after a day of harvesting hay. The men were sitting around the fireplace smoking pipes, chewing tobacco and talking. The women were either talking to each other or reading some of the magazines we had brought from town. Me and the other children were laying in our beds whispering to each other, playing little games while trying not to be heard by the adults downstairs. At about this time of night, one of the men had walked outside to the outhouse, which was behind the main house next to the forest. As he was reaching it, he heard an owl hooting from the trees. He didn't think that was weird, owls were common, but the thing that made him stop walking was how the owl's hoot changed to a coyote howl. After that, it became a donkey braying, and after that it was a high-pitched whistle. The man yelled into the woods, thinking and hoping it was just someone playing a trick. He walked back into the main house and peed beside the porch, even though the women told him not to do it in the past. He didn't care about what they had to say. He didn't feel right about using the outhouse at that moment. About half an hour later, the dog starts barking. The men shrug it off, thinking it's a deer or something. But the barking got worse. It almost sounded like the dog was barking at an intruder. And then, just as suddenly, the dog stopped barking. The men knew something was up. So did the women. So a few of them went outside to check on the dog. When they found the dog behind the barn, its belly was ripped open, and its tongue appeared to have been bitten off. They knew a coyote didn't do this, nor a bobcat. One of the men picked up the corpse of the dog, and they all walked back to the main house to get a rifle and bury it. As they were burying the dog, the horses inside the barn started raising hell. The men knew whatever it was that killed the dog was now after the horses. So they ran into the barn and ripped open the door. They calmed the horses and searched the barn for the animal. And as they were searching, one of the men pointed that all of the horses' tails were braided. At about the time he pointed this out, they heard footsteps in the hayloft. Two of the men rushed to climb the ladder, but when they got to the top, they found no one. Everyone knew what had visited the farm that night. It is known for witches to braid the tails of horses. It is known for them to make weird sounds to draw in their prey. It's a story that I'll never forget. It's something that will always make my skin crawl. I've been a hotel night auditor for eight and a half years without much trouble. The hotel where I work, night auditors always work alone, unless we were training someone new. We always lock our front entrance automated doors at midnight. One night around 1am a guy comes to the door. I called the entrance phone and ask how I can help him. He says that he needs to rent a room, so I buzz him in. He comes to the counter and asks the rate. When I tell him the price, he asks if he can use the restroom. He comes back and insists he needs water. I tell him where the faucet is, which is right next to the restroom that he just used. By this time, I think he's gonna rob me. I feel like telling him just to rob me to get it over with, and he comes back from getting water and asks if he can use the phone. He can't work the hotel phone because you have to dial nine for an outside line, and that confuses him. 
So I dial the number for him, and my hands are shaking so badly that I have to try and dial it a few times. Instead of asking him the number, I write it down, and when I finally get it right, there's no answer on the other line. Then, this guy leaves. I swear to myself that I will not open the doors for anyone else tonight. And around 4am a different guy comes to the door and asks if he can use the phone. I'm not opening it for anyone. So I ask the number, and I go to call it. And I realise it's the same number the first guy gave me. I can only see one person standing in front of all the glass doors, but I hear someone coughing, and it's not the guy I'm talking to. I know something is up, and instead of calling the number, I call the cops. Five minutes later, two cop cars pull up. The first guy runs into the woods, and the second guy is still in the entrance, unable to run. The cop comes in to let me know what's going on. Earlier that night, there was a big fight at a trailer park down the road, and these guys were involved, and the police have been looking for them all night. People were hurt pretty bad because of these guys. The two guys had to get away and had no phone, so they were trying to make a call for a ride out of town. If they would have been up front with me from the beginning about needing to use the phone instead of freaking me out, they might have gotten away. This occurred when I was about seven to eight years old, and is a story that I only just recently remembered. It was summertime, and my mom was having a garage sale in our driveway. Her, me, my brother, who was aged four or five at the time, and my grandmother, my mother's mum, were all seated inside of the garage during the sale. Me and my brother, of course, had been playing a bit though, running from our yard and then back to our driveway and such. We had a few visitors, but it was one woman who was responsible for this story. She was older, about 70 something, and walked with a limp. I remember this because she had a cane. She was on foot and was carrying nothing but a small red toolbox, not a lunchbox, a literal metal toolbox. She carried things inside of that that you could hear clanging around. My dad had one just like it when I was a kid, that I wasn't allowed to touch because he was a plumber and didn't want me or my brother near his expensive tool set. So I found it strange that she was just walking around with it. She didn't greet us. She just started picking things up and looking at them. My mum decided to initiate conversation, and this is how it went. Hi, good morning. Do you have anything for free? Excuse me? Items I can pick up, like this. Is this for free? No, sorry. Everything has a sticker on it with a price. Why is it not free? I... It's a garage sale. I'm trying to sell things. It was at this point the lady went quiet, and my mum just stood up staring at her. My grandma called me and my brother to sit behind her, and we watched and waited for something else to happen. The woman set her toolbox on one of our tables, and opened it up to reveal a bunch of random things. Little trinkets, loose change, actual tools. She had everything from Kleenex to quarters. It was weird. She motioned towards a small group of figurines my mum was selling, and asked if she could have one for free. At this point, my mum was getting annoyed, and wanted this lady to leave. She said so, and the woman started walking towards us. She said something about how cute me and my brother were, as we sat ducking behind my grandmother's chair. She started walking into our garage, and my mum told her to stop, and repeated that she should leave. She said something else about me and my brother, and asked if we liked her trinkets while she stood staring at us. And my grandma chimed in that she would call the police if the woman didn't leave. She then 
slowly turned around, walking back to her toolbox, lifting up one of the figurines and very obviously putting it in the box without paying for it. My mum didn't fight her, just told her to leave now. So she did. She wandered up and down our street away from our driveway, but within eyesight. We kept an eye on her for the rest of the day as she roamed around our neighborhood and surrounding streets until she finally left. It was super weird, and us kids were advised not to leave our garage sale for the rest of the day. The story continues. About a week later, when me and my brother were playing outside again, we have landscaping around our house, which are rocks that have flower planters and birdhouses, nothing too spectacular. And it wasn't unusual for me and my brother to climb and stand on these rocks as kids. We started walking around my house to do this, and then went inside to get a drink or something of a sort. We weren't gone for more than a few minutes when we came back outside and returned to the exact spot that we had just been in and immediately noticed that woman with the same bright red toolbox sitting on top of one of the rocks in our landscape. I ran back inside with my brother to inform our parents. My dad went outside to retrieve the toolbox and it was the same that the woman had had with her items still stored inside. I hadn't seen her since the garage sale, still never have, but somehow she managed to leave that toolbox there without being noticed, which meant she had to have been watching and waiting for the ideal moment. The creepiest part is that our yard is away from our garage. In order to get to that part of our landscaping, you would have to go up our driveway and literally walk across the entire length of our lawn in front of our house and then to the side in order to place it there, since we have thick hedges blocking the rest of our yard from the public. We have two big windows on the front and side of our house that were open, which just creeps me out more when I think she could have been watching us from the outside. I don't remember what my parents did with said toolbox. I'm pretty sure they threw it away. None of us have seen that woman again. Also, there's no chance that we missed the toolbox the first time round. It was bright red and literally within our walking path. And I noticed it was there as soon as I turned the corner of our yard. There was no missing it. I don't know what her intentions were but I'm glad we haven't encountered her since. Toolbox lady, let's not meet again. About nine years ago, my dad's side of the family was talking about how they would hear and see witches in their younger days. My grandfather started to explain on how his father would see ladies at night walking towards this small lake in the outskirts of town and they all carried a cat each, which he pointed out that cats didn't seem to have eyes, so it was rare to see these ladies. He said this was mostly at 2 to 3 a.m., because at 5 a.m., he would go to wash his clothes as the small lake was connected to the other water source, and the ladies would always seem to leave about 5 a.m. when he and the other people would show up. Even my grandma had encountered them, and I'm not sure because she sadly passed away before my dad turned five. But I know that my grandfather said she would always be scared of them because they had long nails and wore hoods. Not only this, small kids would always end up with bite marks. Full moon days were the worst, as it seemed like there was smoke at the lake and somehow it made people afraid to go early. He did say something about trying to go into and do some witch hunts, but oddly enough, the guy that he was going to do it with never appeared. This guy's disappearance connected to him, talking later on some treasure that the ladies had given him to leave them alone. Two others had gone with him, but only one showed up, and he had gone mad. They couldn't speak anymore, 
just scream. He'd been traumatized by something, and he died in hospital days later. Many years later, the infrastructure in the area became more prevalent, and the sightings of those ladies vanished. There are mountains that are said to be the home of their new location, although it's more common than the city folk believe in them less, as the rural areas are where they seem to congregate. From the time I was born, through around the time I was 14 years old, I lived in the country. The summer of 2011, my family moved into a house that was downtown in the city. Needless to say, I was stoked. We had experienced some paranormal type stuff in the house, so the family was already a little nervous about the new place. A neighbor had also told us that he thinks the lady that lived in our house before us had ended her husband's life, but we shrugged it off and thought that he was joking. Fast forward about a week, and my grandfather was outside messing around in the garage. I could hear him talking to somebody outside, as I looked out the window to see it was a woman, in her early 40s, talking to my grandfather. I see him shaking his head, and she seemed super sad. She then fell to her knees and was practically sobbing to him. I felt super uneasy, but didn't want to place myself within the awkward situation. After she left, I asked what she wanted, and to my surprise he told me that she was the previous homeowner, and wanted to come into the house to specifically check the fireplace and attic. I thought quickly about what the neighbor had told us. Maybe this lady had killed her husband and hidden him in one of those places. I know it seems like a movie thing to do, but why else would they only care about those things? Maybe she'd hidden money and stashed it there. Another few weeks passed and my sister was home alone. She was constantly out and about, so she hadn't heard about the previous owner. When she was about to get into the shower, she heard someone trying to open the front door. Fortunately, it was locked. My sister said she'd seen the lady run around the house and begin banging on all the doors and windows, begging to be let in. My sister called my mother, terrified. So we both drove home quickly, but the woman was gone. My mother called the police, but they said that they really couldn't do anything about it since she had left. At this point, I was scared. I'd watched so many horror films that I knew it couldn't end well. Things began to stop happening around a year and a half. A friend of mine had moved in with us, and one day we were outside playing basketball. An SUV pulled up next to our driveway, and when the window was rolled down, it was in fact the crazy lady. She looked like she had fixed herself up and was now somewhat attractive. She began flirting with me and my friend, calling us cute and winking, but I knew what she was doing. She asked if I'd take her into the house, and I said no, but she persisted. Luckily, my mother came out and began speaking to the woman. The lady started crying and begging to be let into the house because she desperately needed to see the fireplace and attic. My mother continued to say no, but the lady wouldn't leave. This part now may seem a little harsh, but I didn't really know what else to do. At the time, I was just getting into making films, and I had very real looking prop guns in the house. At this point, my mom and the lady began, not really fighting, but it seemed like a conversation that would result in a fight. I took one of the prop guns outside, which was very stupid, and put it in my pants in front of the lady. As I figured, the lady said a few last words to my mother and drove off quickly. And after that, we had never seen her again. Whenever we were finally able to speak to the neighbor that told us the previous owner ended her husband's life, he practically said, I told you so. 
and told us that he thought we should rip the fireplace apart and check the attic. We decided not to. We lived in that house for close to eight years and just recently moved back to the country. There's been odd stuff happening at our new house, but I'm glad we're far away from that crazy lady. And I really hope to not meet her again. So I have this story. A lady brought her service animal on board. Turns out it was just a pet she had brought a vest for. This dog was completely out of control. He was jumping all over us in the row, barking, growling, snapping at people, and running all over the place. The flight attendant told her she would need to keep the dog in the carrier, and the lady turned into a witch, saying that she had no right to tell her to put her service dog away. Mid-flight, the dog took a dump right on the aisle floor, and it reeked so bad. Her dog had crawled up in my face, and its long nails scratched me through my shirt so hard that I began bleeding. After I got off the plane, I met up with my family and they said, Oh my god, you smell like a wet dog. And I had to tell them this story of this awful lady and her service dog. At one time, my parents owned the house my brother and sister-in-law now live in as a beach house. When I stayed there alone, the weirdest things would happen. Like odd noises coming from the kitchen in the middle of the night. If I was there with certain friends of mine, it would be a different story. There are two incidences that stick out in recent memory. The first one took place when one was sleeping on the futon in the living room, which we did because the only beds we were allowed to sleep on were extremely uncomfortable. So we just used them to hold our clothes and toiletries. I have extremely bad eyesight. So while watching TV that night, I was wearing my glasses. Then when I decided to go to sleep, I took them off and set them on the arm of the futon folded up so they would be handy in the morning. Well, that turned out not to be the case. I reached over to grab them and they were gone. I wanted to be sure I wasn't jumping to any conclusions, so I started looking in all the places they could logically be, between the futon arm and mattress, under the futon and under the bookcase, in the bathroom, etc. But I couldn't find them. Annoyed but wanting to proceed with the day, I put on my contact lenses, and Tracy walks into the bedroom where we all had our stuff, and comes back saying, You've got to see this. After I followed her in there, she lifts up one of her shirts. And lo and behold, there are my glasses underneath it. Open and upside down, as though someone had been wearing them. Now keep in mind, Tracy does also wear glasses. But her prescription is widely different from mine. This means she would have noticed immediately if she had picked up mine by mistake. And even then, why would she have put them under her shirt? Neither of us ever had any history of sleepwalking, so I doubt it was something like that. Unless she confessed it herself, I refuse to entertain the notion this could have been a prank. The second incident is even more inexplicable. This time I was staying with Tracy and a guy I was dating at the time who we called Big John, since he was literally about seven feet tall. Tracy slept on one of the two tiny rock-hard beds in the spare room, and John and I slept on the futon. Next morning, John and I were both awake, but not really moving or speaking yet. I felt him turn to look at the bookcase. That was about three feet from the futon, but he didn't move in a manner that would have allowed him to touch anything on it. After he looked away, a picture of my brother and dad fell off its shelf where it was a couple of inches back from the edge and fell to the floor when shattered. After my parents sold the house to my brother, his stepson would complain about things like his dresser drawers opening and shutting by themselves at night. My sister-in-law is not the type of person to allow something like that to scare her children. So she firmly told the entity that it was perfectly welcome to stay. 
but messing with the kids was not going to be tolerated. After that, things calmed down until they expanded the house. So my sister-in-law had to reiterate her original terms. Earlier this year during the spring, my wife had planned a trip with an older woman who she befriended. They had been friends even before I first met my wife. She had mentioned to me before that her friend was a witch and routinely performed rituals with animal limbs. I don't know anything about witches to be honest, but what I experienced leads me to believe that she's bad news. I've yet to meet her in person, but strange things have happened after she visited our apartment. My wife's friend drove to our apartment early one Thursday morning so that they could carpool to their destination. I work during the afternoon and into the night, so her knocking woke me up. My wife was already awake and greeted her at the door. They had a brief conversation in the living room and were on their way. After they left, I had a hard time returning to sleep, so I tried to kill some time on my phone. It was just after 9am when I felt some unusual vibrations underneath my bed. I was confused at first and thought I was experiencing an earthquake. The vibration then turned into what I can only describe as someone kicking my mattress from underneath it. I sat up in bed and carefully observed other objects in the room to see if they were also shaking and to see if this really was an earthquake. Nothing else in the room was affected. No later than 10 seconds after sitting up, I felt my king-sized mattress come up off the bed frame about two to three inches and lightly lean from left to right. After that, the mattress settled back on the frame. My body became unusually warm and I was too scared to jump out of bed, fearing something would grab my ankles as soon as I touched the floor. Before my parents split up, we used to live in this huge old house. We lived in that old leaky house until I was around 14. The thought was to renovate the nearly 100 year old house, but I guess life got in the way for my parents. The house had two floors and all of our bedrooms were up on the second floor. The largest part of the second floor was dominated by the attic. It was a creepy attic filled with discarded things from both our family and the previous owners. I knew the attic pretty well, because although I was terrified of it, me and my best friend would hide things we shouldn't have in there. A stolen baseball bat, fireworks, and other things 10 to 14 year olds should hide from their parents. The attic had an old wooden door that had a key in it. The door was always locked, unless someone was in there. My bedroom shared a wall with this attic. I had insomnia when I was a kid, or at least the doctors told my parents it was insomnia. One of my biggest secrets is that I slept with a nightlight on, hiding under the covers and pillows until I was 14. I would strategize how I would sleep and make it look like the bed was empty by sleeping under the mattress or by having my head under the pillows. The reason? Almost every night I would hear stuff from the attic shift and move. It often sounded like someone was rolling heavy balls or bowling balls across the floor in the attic. Sometimes I would hear knocks on the walls. Sometimes I heard what sounded like whispers. Me and my best friend would sometimes summon the courage to explore the attic in the daytime, always with the door open, never alone. I was obsessed with finding the balls, the ones I heard rolling across the floor. The other sounds I could write off as sounds a house would make, but the rolling balls and the whispers were unexplained. We never found the rolling balls or any other source that could explain it. I'm sure there could be a plausible explanation, but I never found one. 
I do not believe in the supernatural, but for some reason I still get scared thinking about it. We moved when I was 14, and the first night after we moved, I slept with all the lights off, head on the pillow. I have slept well since. I spoke with my mother about these things a few years ago, when I told her about the sounds. She grew a fearful expression, and said that she didn't want to talk about it anymore. I was flying home from Aruba on a family vacation as a kid. It was a fairly smooth flight on a 747. All of a sudden, we heard the engine spin up big time and the plane dives, like super steep dives, and you can hear and feel the acceleration. Naturally, people are screaming and freaking the hell out, and after no more of 10 to 20 seconds, but that actually felt endless, we level off and the engines decelerate. Then the pilot comes up on the intercom with something along the lines of, sorry about that folks, there was an inbound other country 747 on the same altitude as us, and we couldn't get communication confirmation, so we had to execute an emergency dive to prevent a collision. Fun times. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted, and she could sense a presence there. She said she heard someone call her name, and that she felt someone put a hand on her shoulder. There was one time, she woke up with someone holding her feet down, and she couldn't shake whatever it was and started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3am. I am a night owl, and it wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I heard very faint footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mum's or sister's, so I assumed my dad was walking around checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark, and no one was up there. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, and at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house with the driveway, when someone was pulling up to the house, as if they wanted to see who had arrived. It was almost cool in the daytime, but terrifying at night. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed, as well as in the closet at night. I always tried to convince myself it was air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom and never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet and when I'd pull it off, there'd be no one there. I'd hear sighs as if someone was standing right behind me and there was one occasion where I heard a whisper Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I'd also ask them to quiet down, and that helped too. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement, and heard the garage door open and the voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hello, to discover an empty house. There was another time when my boyfriend stayed overnight, he slept in the living room, and in the morning he asked if we were playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor, and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball, and certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time my mum heard a baby cry outside of our house at night. 
We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb, and there was no reason a baby would be in our backyard. One day, a lid flew off a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker, just a regular lid and a pot. Another time we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said he was in the house and decided to make my bed as we left at some ungodly hour like 5 a.m. and I never got the chance to do it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like someone was breathing down his neck. He kept turning around to find no one there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his leg from underneath the bed. He got freaked and ran out and refused to enter the house again and just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. My sister one night awoke to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window as her window faced the backyard and trees. And being on the second floor, there was no possible source of lights from cars. She covered her head with the blanket. And when she looked out, the figure and orb were still there. She went back under the blanket and after some time they were finally gone. Our cat disappeared without a trace some day as well. We are unsure if it's related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TVs and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could have been a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4am next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face and he's extremely sensitive to light to the point where he covered any electronic lights with napkins as they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom as I could feel someone moving around in the room at night and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house, a boy, an old lady, a couple and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house now and they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college where I slept with the lights on although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days always sleeping with the lights on as the creepy feeling remained despite nothing noticeable happening anymore. Eventually my parents sold the house. I worked the night shift at a gas station and it was in a neighborhood that was directly across the street from an assisted housing complex for section 8 people. So there were a lot of mentally ill people that had schizophrenia and drug problems. About four months into the job, I started hearing blood curdling screams from a man yelling for something and about someone to get away and cursing a lot. Bear in mind this is all on the night shift. Then I saw him. From outside the window I saw a middle aged man, overweight, with a scruffy beard. He was African American. Not that that has anything to do with his actions, but just so that you get a picture for this guy. He was missing teeth and he'd be screaming at all hours of the night. And we closed for a few hours between 3 and 5 a.m. to clean. And he'd come into the store at 2.50 on the dot right before I was allowed to close the doors. 
He would mumble to himself and say things like, Ah, we don't need that. And, well, we don't have enough money. I just thought he was nuts. He would also ask how much everything was, even though he was standing right next to the price tags of stuff, and it was very annoying. This kind of stuff continued for six months straight. A lot of the time during this happened, there would be others that came in at the same time as he, in order to get alcohol, and they lived in the housing complex, because they all knew the screaming guy. I guess he was hot topic in the apartments. Anyway, one night the screaming guy leaves, and a different guy that's also in the store comes up to me and tells me to not let him into the store anymore, because he's got bad juju. I'm a pretty level-headed guy, and skeptical, but what this guy told me creeped me out. He said he's positive the screaming guy lives alone in his apartment and he was invited into his place once because he was less crazy at that point and then got worse. The dude tells me that when he was in Crazy Guy's apartment, that he would feel like someone would pop out at any moment and that he felt like he was being watched and it felt like a very negative place to be in. The day gets later and the normal dude decides to leave and when he left Crazy's place, he looked in his apartment window from the outside and saw multiple shadows that looked like human shapes walking past the shades of the windows. He said he went back one more time to hang out, but never did again, when the crazy started saying that they're stealing his thoughts and memories. So I hear the stories, and I'm now like, wow, that's nuts. And the normal guy just says that he's not trying to freak me out, but that it's just better to be far away because trouble follows him. So one day the crazy guy comes back at midnight, same time as always, and I tell him he's not allowed in the store anymore, and he begins to walk around the store and ask how much everything is, and I'm begging him to leave at this point, and he gets mad at me, and says he's not gonna leave until he can bag a buy of Cheetos. So I sell them to him, and it's around 3.03 a.m. at this point, and he picks up the chips and says, they see you now, they don't like you, and then walks out and literally starts screaming at the top of his lungs in the parking lot. I locked those doors so fast it was insane. A few weeks pass and I barely saw him, but he always said, they see you, when he'd come in. One day I worked a mid-shift and got off at 11.30pm. I clocked out and started walking down the street to my house, and I see the crazy guy sitting on a chair on the second story of the apartment complex, outside what I assume is his apartment. And I see him in the chair, and then I look at his window, and the curtains are closed, but I saw three human-shaped silhouettes like solid shadows right up against the window, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, when I remembered the story the guy told me. I ran home so fast, I thought I was going to break the sound barrier. This happened in my childhood and teen years, back when I was living in Venezuela. I am now 29 years old and living in the United Kingdom. My parents are originally from Portugal but immigrated to Venezuela looking for a better life. We lived in a massive apartment complex with over 30 different apartments. My mum was close friends with a couple of neighbours from the ground floor as we lived on the third. These two neighbours were brother and sister. The brother lived alone with a husky, while the sister lived with her two sons who were really good friends of mine. Now it's important to point out that the sister was a divorced mum, whose ex-partner was a very wealthy truck company owner. She had everything paid for by her ex-partner, from the apartment she lived in to daily groceries and anything she needed. After all, she was bringing up his two sons. Now ever since I can remember, 
my mum and the sister would always lightheartedly joke about a ghostly apparition they named Francisco. I must preface by saying that I have neither recollection or don't think I ever have seen Francisco myself, but recall them saying he was a smartly dressed man with a moustache that was always seen walking around the apartment complex. I recall multiple times where my mum and or sister would point out that they could see Francisco, and I was not able to see him myself. Now, Francisco appeared to be a friendly ghost, and was never threatening to anyone. However, Francisco's presence was mainly felt in the brother's apartment, who lived right next to his sister. The brother always used to joke that he and Francisco were roommates, and never felt threatened by him. He used to tell us that at night he could hear Francisco running around the house, opening closets and cabinet doors, and that he was so active that he would yell at him to shut up and take a shower and watch TV. He would then either hear all the taps in the bathroom open, and or the TV turning on. Multiple times throughout my childhood, I recalled playing with their sons in the corridor, and hearing loud noises coming from the brother's apartment when there was no one there. Whether that be furniture clashing, doors opening and shutting, to loud sounds of glass and plates being smashed. Most of the time, we would inform the sister who would check the apartment, and confirm that everything was fine. This continued for a few years, with nothing major to mention apart from the above. Suddenly, the activity began to increase, with a lot more apparitions and the brother mentioning that Francisco was a lot more restless and active than usual. His own husky would cower in the corner when in the house, terrified of being alone. And this is the first time weird things started to happen. The sister would be involved in a massive car crash, where she was lucky to come out alive. The eldest of her sons fell down a huge flight of stairs, breaking his leg and cracking a few ribs. And finally, her mum came to visit her and her sons for a few days. She was around 50 years old and healthy. One evening, while sitting at home with her daughter and grandsons, she had a sudden heart attack and passed away. This shocked everyone, as she had no reports of heart issues and had been completely fine up until that moment. Things went back to normal in the following weeks. Shortly after that, my parents decided to move to another city, and I completely forgot about Francisco and the things that happened. Years later, the sister and brother also moved out, but something surprising happened. It was common knowledge that Francisco lived with her brother, or at least, that's where he was most active. But Francisco tagged along following the move. He went with the sister rather than the brother. Now most of this has been told to me by my mum, as she kept in close contact with the sister. But from what she remembers, it's that following the move, Francisco started going absolutely crazy in the new house from cabinet doors and shelves opening and closing frantically, to objects being thrown around the house. The sister had been harmed a few times by scratches along her back, and almost every night the duvet would be pulled off while she slept. It got to the point where the sister and her sons would sleep in the same bedroom, and pray every night for it to stop. One day, deciding that they couldn't live like this anymore, a priest was brought into the house and did a blessing. Immediately following the blessing of the house, her kitchen caught fire, but thankfully it was contained to just that area. The cause of the fire was determined to be a candle that was lighted to a cross of Jesus Christ. Now the only way this would have caused a fire was if someone would have tipped it over intentionally. However, there was no one home and the windows were closed so this was obviously blamed on Francisco. Around the same time, her youngest son was caught in a crossfire between the police and local gang, but he managed to get away from it unscathed. Following this, the sister and her ex-partner decided to speak with a local witch 
who dealt with white magic. The witch came to the house and immediately began to speak with Francisco out loud. It turns out the reason he was smartly dressed was because he was a dentist when alive and always liked to keep up appearances. He also died young, was buried at 30, and apparently someone had performed black magic using the earth from his grave and brought him back to the world of the living with one task, take one life with him every 10 years. The first life he took was the grandmother 10 years earlier, and it was coming up to the 20 year mark. It was the reason he was a lot more active and the weird things started happening again. But above all, he wanted to rest in peace. The witch managed to contain him to a jar and take him with her with the promise he will have a proper burial and will be able to rest in peace. He was apparently temporarily released in her backyard, which he went absolutely crazy on smashing things and breaking windows before being buried and put to rest. Now, it has been theorized by my mum and the sister that this could have only been done by the new wife of the sister's ex-partner. She hated the sister and her sons because they were living off her husband and both had multiple raging arguments, cursing each other and wishing death on the other. The sister believes the new wife must have spread the cursed dirt on one of her pot plants when she came to visit with her ex-partner. It's a long story, but one I always use when someone claims to not believe in the paranormal. I love having my mum tell the story and seeing the look on their face. When I was younger, my older cousin lived with us for a bit because she was having behavioural problems at home. My parents had to go at night to pick someone up from the airport, so they left my brother and I with her. My brother and I were both in bed in my room at this point, as I think it was a school night, and she was up in the other room doing homework. But she finished up, so came into our room to lay down with us. But as soon as she opened the door, our house alarm started going off. She quickly shut the door and came over to tell me to be quiet before going back to close the door since it didn't have a lock. My brother, who's a year older than me, woke up very confused and the alarms were going off and we were all scared out of our minds and couldn't even call for help because her phone was taken away and we were too young to have one. Our only option was the landline, the one in the kitchen and the one in my parents bedroom. So we all get ready at the same time and run into my parents room and lock their door. My cousin checks their bathroom and closet to make sure no one's hiding there before calling my parents to let them know what's happening. They say they're only two minutes away and not to worry. But let me tell you, those were the longest two minutes of my life. After all is said and done, we find out through the alarm company that the window in my parents' room is what tripped the alarm, and that's the room we went to. To this day, my parents are convinced she was just trying to sneak in a boyfriend or something, but I'm certain someone was trying to rob the place or worse, and got scared off by the alarm because of how completely terrified my cousin looked. When I was eight, my entire family moved from San Diego County to the middle of nowhere in Colorado. After less than two years of being there and having to put up with the ridiculous weather, my oldest brother decided he's finally had enough. He got his GED and left his ferrets behind for us to take care of them, since they're illegal in California and headed west to move in with a friend or at least he tried to. He didn't even make it five hours before his car completely died because it couldn't handle driving through the Rockies. He was stranded in a tiny podunk town after dark and his car got towed to a garage while the tow truck driver offered to drive him to a cheap but nice motel to spend the night since we couldn't get to him until the next day. 
They passed by a Motel 6 or some other chain motel like that. But the driver said, Ugh, I wouldn't leave my dog in a place like that. There's a way nicer motel just down the road for the same price. And kept driving until they showed up at this really rundown looking place. My brother thought it looked pretty bad, but he's kind of a shy and non-confrontational person. He's also scrawny and completely unintimidating, so he didn't say anything and just thanked the guy. He couldn't see it at night, but when my mum and I got there the next day, we realised just how weird the place was. They had a big pool right smack in the middle of the parking lot, but it was drained dry and looked like it had never been used. The entire family that owned the place, mom, dad, daughter and son, sat on plastic long chairs in between the pool and the building, facing the motel rooms all day long. Then we saw the inside of his room. The bathroom had a small window, which isn't unusual, but it was only two feet off the ground and next to the toilet, with nothing covering it or obstructing the view of anyone using the toilet, meaning anyone outside, like the owners, could watch you doing your business. There wasn't even a spot for a toilet paper holder, so the roll just had to sit on a shelf, and the whole room looked pretty run down. My brother then quietly told us he barely got any sleep the night before, because he was so terrified. At first, we assumed it was just because he was sleeping in a strange place alone, when he was only 17, but he pointed out a door near his bed. His room was the kind where it's connected to the room next to it by a hallway only a few feet long with a door in each room. So large families staying in adjacent rooms can keep it open and get between the two without having to deal with keys. He said he heard a faint noise coming from the next room to his the night before. So we opened the door to see what was going on and there was enough of a gap underneath to see that someone was standing right on the other side of the far door. My brother watched for a few minutes and the guy's shadow never shifted. So he got creeped out and closed his own door, making sure to lock it and went to bed. He woke up at some point to a strange sound and sat there trying to identify it for a minute before he suddenly realized it was a doorknob rattling. The guy had finally opened his own door and was trying to get into my brother's room. The sound stopped after a few minutes, but he was too scared to fall back asleep in case the guy tried again and picked the lock. And he was just telling us this story quietly in case the guy could hear him through the walls. He never saw what he looked like, but who knows if the guy watched him while he checked into the room or something. I have no idea what he was planning on doing to my brother, but I'm sure it wasn't good. Add this to the strange, frustrating conversation my mum had with the owner of the hotel over the phone on the drive up, and the weird ass mechanic shop the car was towed to, and the town became one of the creepiest places we'd ever had the misfortune of stopping in. It would have cost more to fix the car than it was actually worth, so we just abandoned it and my brother had to come home again, which he was actually happy to do after such a freaky experience. I was flying from Vegas to Stockton. Mistake number one, Stockton. And right at takeoff, the plane started shaking violently. I admit this can be normal, but the pilot somehow turned on the intercom and was shouting, whoa, whoa, like he was terrified, which in turn made me terrified. I literally started to cry. I thought this was the end. For the first time in my life, I had never until that moment actually felt like I could perish. They turned off the intercom pretty quickly. And after the longest minute of my life, the plane stopped shaking and I silently wept for the rest of the 30 minute flight. They never addressed what happened. They never reassured anyone. They just pretended 
like it didn't happen. Now, I am no novice to air travel. I have flown all over the world, and have even felt a little jittery about flying in the past. But I can honestly say that I don't know if I can ever be so casual about flying again. I had my Nintendo Wii down in the basement for the longest time, and would spend hours down there. I was playing one night, and all of a sudden the TV and Wii turned off. I went to check the plug because it was loose sometimes, and could theoretically fall out if pulled. I wasn't pulling it to turn it off though, as I was gaming, and not near the cords. I looked up from the cords as I was fixing it, and saw a light grey mist in the air. I looked at it for a few seconds and then ran upstairs like the floor was on fire, and didn't go there for a while again. I have thought over it now that I'm older, and can't really see how a mist could just appear there. No leaking pipes to create moisture, no one in the house that smokes anything. The only person who smoked in my family was my grandfather, who had been deceased for a while at that point. I did have his pilot's vest hanging nearby at the time though. All of this happened before my parents' divorce. We were all living in a two-story house with an attic and a basement. It was a normal house for a family of five. My parents, myself, and my two siblings. At night, my parents were sleeping on the first floor, and me and my siblings on the second. I always felt really uncomfortable in this house, especially when I was upstairs. I don't really know why, but I felt really anxious and nervous, and my brother was also feeling the same. Some stuff happened to the two of us. He heard some voices calling him, and even a knock in the attic. When I was alone in the house, and I was in my bedroom, I would hear as if someone were moving the chairs in the living room, and recently, my sister confessed she had heard the same thing. Even if it was scary, we were used to it, and would try and find rational explanations to these sounds. However, there is one event that my brothers and I still cannot explain. It happened about six years ago. It was around 3 a.m. and I remember that I was feeling quite anxious for no reason. That's why I decided to text one of my friends instead of trying to sleep. My sister used to sleepwalk. It stopped after we moved and this night, as she usually did, she went out of her bed, walked a bit into the hall and went back to her room. The walls were very thin, so I heard her when she closed her door and went back into bed, and that was it. She didn't move again. But after that, someone was still walking in the hall. I first thought it was my brother, that I didn't hear him go out of his bedroom, but as I was about to check on him, it stopped, and that's when I heard someone scratching at my door. I still remember the noise. It was slow and loud, and lasted for about a minute. I was too scared to go out. I tried to convince myself it was my brother, but about five to ten minutes after the scratching noise stopped, I heard him leave his bedroom to go to the bathroom, and then return to sleep, and didn't stir again. At this point I was really confused and afraid, I just couldn't go out of my bedroom anymore. I never checked who or what was behind the door. At some point, I fell asleep, only because I was so exhausted. My bedside lamp was still on. I don't know how much sleep I got, but I awoke during the night and my lamp was off. I thought the light bulb had burnt out, but no, someone had switched it off. In the morning, as soon as I went downstairs, my brother came to me and asked if I had heard the noises in the hall during the night, if I heard the footsteps, and if I heard a voice. 
I told him that I had. Except for the voice. And that's when he told me that after he went back to bed, he heard someone whisper his name, but loud enough to wake him. And that's when he saw his door half open, even though he was sure he had closed it. I also asked for the switch, but everyone just looked at me as if I was crazy and told me that no one went inside my room during the night. When my parents got divorced, we moved into another house with my mum, and now I go to my dad's only every two weeks for the weekend. But since we moved, I feel less anxious when I'm at his house, and nothing else happened. The thing is, I still don't understand. Why did my sister never experience anything? Why did it suddenly stop? And obviously, what or who was behind my door that night? When I was 13, I moved from my hometown in Tennessee to a whole new place in northern Michigan. There, I met my best friend, Lena. Anyway, she's like my twin sister. That's what we call ourselves. Lena has two younger sisters, Katie and Marina. Lena and I had a friend called Bear. We also had a friend who I would later date named Ronnie. Ronnie and Bear knew a girl called Mandy, who is the antagonist of this story. We met Mandy in high school our freshman year. She's 17, we're 14. No big deal. Most of us hang out with older kids anyway. She was a little annoying, but we dealt with it because Bear had a crush on Mandy's older brother. So the stalking wasn't really starting at first. Mainly, she was annoying and tried to tag along with us for everything and was mostly just generally a nuisance. She had a class with Lena and most often would hang out around her before and after. Eventually, Mandy began to crave Lena's attention. She would tug on Lena's hair in class when she was talking to our other friends, be very loud and aggressive towards them when she was told to hold on, and shoved herself into Lena's personal space. She would take pictures of Bear, Ronnie, Lena and I, and anyone else who she knew, and post them all over the internet. Ronnie had explicitly stated that he didn't want pictures of himself on the web, but she posted them anyway. She went as far as to use the pictures she had taken of them without their knowledge and posted them without her consent as her Facebook profile picture. She went to Bear's apartment one day and ended up giving her a ring. Her parents got angry for I can only guess why and Mandy decided to lie and tell them the Bear had stolen the ring from her. She then told them that the Bear had lost it. This got Bear into deeper trouble with Mandy's parents, despite it not being true. They later learned it wasn't the case, as they found out Mandy was stealing money from them constantly. Mandy started getting worse and worse. I confronted her about her physical abuse towards Lena, and told her to either leave her alone completely, or stop being so irritating, and told her that I would personally kick her if I heard she had been physically harming her again and for a while, it stopped. She began showing up to places we were going and forcing herself into the group. One very important example of this was a birthday party Lena had. She was turning 15, and it was a cosplay party. She showed up unannounced and uninvited to Lena's home in a Halloween costume, feigning ignorance when we told her she'd not been invited and she wasn't allowed to be at Lena's home. She showed up to Ronnie's house while he was alone, prompted me to get rather angry as she had a crush on him, and she claimed she knew I was dating him at the time. Ronnie told her to leave, and she said he didn't want anything romantic from her at all because he had a girlfriend. She didn't leave until Ronnie's mum came home and threatened to call the police. A fun tidbit about this is that Ronnie had no neighbours for miles. He lived on farmland miles outside of the nearest city. Hell, he lived miles from me. 
and I was at least 10 minutes from the city. She had to have intentionally showed up and she was obviously not popping in while in the area. Things seemed to calm down once I moved again. I had long since broken things off with Ronnie and we remained friends for a good while. I heard less and less about Mandy until I wondered if anything had even happened. It was finally seemingly over. About a year ago, I was asked by Lena if I remembered Mandy. I told that I did, of course, and I asked why. She then dropped a bomb on me. Lena was a Christian for a while when I knew her. She'd been raised Baptist, and she and her siblings attended a youth group at the church that we had gone to, and I went with them to make them happy, despite the fact I'm Jewish. We were all pretty close with the youth pastor and youth leaders, so I was surprised to hear that they'd stopped going weeks prior. You see, Mandy had been waiting every week at the youth group to see Marina, waiting to ask her out. Mandy, who was now 20 years old, was waiting on a weekly basis to see Marina, who was 12, to ask her on a date. A 20-year-old woman was trying desperately to ask out a 12-year-old girl who wasn't really old enough to know if she even liked anyone, let alone if she was gay or bisexual. I was beyond furious. I was seeing red, then messaged Mandy as she was still in my contacts. She became immediately defensive, asking me over and over who told her and why I wanted to know. Now for the past few years, I've been studying abnormal psychological forensics and criminology to prepare for college and university when I go. This defensive behavior, especially in Mandy, showed me that she was guilty. I didn't answer past, someone told me and I need to know. Shockingly, she told me the truth, said it was true, but that she was done with it now and she had a boyfriend. This made me feel physically ill. I asked how old he was and she told me he was 16. The worst part about everything is in my eyes, trying to ask out a 12 year old girl when she was 20. That is the absolute most sickening thing about it all. And I feel ill just remembering this. Mandy, for your own sake, let's not meet. God only knows what I'd say or do to you if I ever did. The one and only paranormal thing that has ever happened to me was when I was around 14 years old sitting on my couch in my basement alone watching TV. With no warning, I start hearing this low humming noise directly to my left, inches away, and every hair on my left side stands on end. I don't know how, but I had the balls to stand up, walk, and turn off the TV without a remote, and walk up the stairs. All the while, I'm about to OD on adrenaline. Nothing but a noise and a feeling. But I vividly remember repeating in my head, something is right next to me. I never had another incident after that one. I've had more than my fair share of creepy encounters, but this one was particularly dramatic. One where I really did feel my life was in danger. I was on holiday visiting family in South Asia. Having been born and brought up in England, a lot of things over there are quite foreign to me. We, my parents and I, were staying at my uncle's apartment. My aunt and uncle were at work and my parents had gone away for a day trip to visit relatives in a neighboring town, leaving me at home with my two cousins, Hamish and Adam. Adam was eight years old at the time, and Hamish was three, and I was about 13. Adam and Hamish always argued about everything. If one wanted a particular cereal for breakfast, an argument would break out over breakfast choices. Adam is stupid for wanting Cocoa Pops. My shreddies are so much better. I'm not even going to sit here and eat while he eats. Anyway, that sort of stuff. While playing with a toy, let's make the dolls swim in the lake. No, it's not a lake, it's the sea, and so on and so forth. 
I was very used to them disagreeing and squabbling, and couldn't remember any time when they were in harmony, especially over playtime. This might seem like a digression, but it's relevant to this story. On this particular day, Hamish was in the living room, building a Lego boat he had been working on for a few days now. Adam had gone outside to play with his friends on the street. He'd left the door slightly ajar so that he could come and go. It was a hot and humid day as usual. So I went to take a shower and was sitting in my room drying my hair. When Hamish came running in in tears. Tashina, my boat, it's broken. What? My Lego boat, someone stepped on it and broke it. Oh. He grasped my hand and led me to the living room where the boat was snapped. He was upset. It had been his pride and joy. And so I commiserated and reassured him that not all hope was lost and that it shouldn't take too long to fix. I thought he must have broken it himself by accident, perhaps stepping on it and not realizing he had been working on the floor with the boat sitting in the living room rug. With Hamish finally placated, and back to work on his boat. I returned to my room, and a few minutes passed without incident. I could hear Hamish moving around, and I heard Adam come back inside and go to the living room. I got a book and curled up on the bed. It was a lazy, drowsy sort of day. And then, all of it was shattered. Adam and Hamish came charging into my room and was tripping over each other, screaming my name. Hamish ran to me, and Adam paused to slam on the bedroom door to close it behind him. There's a man in our living room. He's wearing a mask, and he had a knife. He must have been the one who broke my boat. Wait, what? I look at the pair of ashen faces completely solemn. Are you playing some sort of game? No, he's wearing a horrible, scary mask, and he has a knife. If they were play-acting, and if this was some sort of pretend game. Where is he? In the living room, Adam said, pointing. He's wearing a mask. Yes, like a Halloween mask with a big, scary smile on it. Smile showing teeth, said Hamish, nodding along furiously. And a knife, said Adam. Big knife, said Hamish. They looked entirely serious and terrified, looking at me with their upturned, earnest and pleading faces. I think more than anything, it was the fact that they agreed upon the description of this man and what he was carrying that really cemented upon me that they were telling the truth. If this had been some sort of pretend game, they would have disagreed by now trying to outdo each other in what he was wearing, or perhaps the weapon he was carrying. Instinctively, I went to the door. I wasn't sure why, or to achieve what purpose. I still wasn't scared. I knew they were telling the truth. But could there be an innocent explanation? They were overexcitable kids. My hand went to the door handle. No, said Adam in a hiss. As they both came running towards me, their hands clawing at me. Don't go there. Wait. Okay. Let me get this straight. He was in the living room. They nodded. What was he doing? How did you manage to escape? Did he threaten you? I was sitting on the sofa watching TV, said Adam. Hamish was on the floor with his boat. The man came in and we saw the knife. What happened then? Was he pointing it at you? No, it was just in his hand. As soon as we saw him, we ran and came to you. The living room has two doors. One that leads to a corridor that basically snakes around the front of the building, and the other one that leads to a corridor to the inside of the apartment. The boys had taken this latter doorway with a man presumably standing by the first one. This story did indeed make sense. It had come so suddenly and was taking me a while to actually process the seriousness of what they were telling me, that there was an intruder inside the apartment with a knife, and I was the oldest, so I was in charge. They had to come to me for protection. Oh God, what to do? 
Okay, let's not panic. We need to call the cops. Mobiles were still uncommon in this era. The only phone in the apartment was the landline. And luckily, it was right outside my room. It was on the table in the corridor facing the door to my room. However, it wasn't a cordless phone. So, if the cord was long enough, I might be able to grab the whole thing and pull it inside and close the door. I rehearsed it in my mind. I need to get the phone so we can call the police. No, the man will get you, said Hamish, clinging at my arm. He might be in the corridor, said Adam. We were all slightly whispering. Well, we can check, I said, my hand going for the handle. No, hissed Adam, as he grabbed my hand, insisting it was dangerous. And I told them I'd just take a peek. Adam, eventually, and reluctantly agreed. I turned the handle slowly, and my stomach felt tight as I did so. The tension of the boys standing next to me didn't help the matters. When it was slightly ajar, I pressed my face into the gap and looked around. The corridor was dark and empty. Okay, I said, turning to face the boys. There's no one there. I'm going to sneak out and grab the phone and come back. Okay? As soon as I get back in with the phone, you close the door behind me. It's only a few steps to the phone. It'll just take a few seconds, don't worry. Adam was a mess, wringing his hands, pleading with me not to go. Hamish stood stoic, nodding, and I pulled the door open further and stepped out. Hamish and Adam crowded into the space I had just vacated, peering out the doorway to watch me. As I stepped outside into the empty, quiet corridor, I began to feel silly. Could this just be the boys' active imagination? Had they seen something on TV and become convinced it was real? Maybe I was just being stupid. Maybe there was no one there, and I was feeling much calmer and incredulous about the whole situation. Still, it was possible, but better to be safe than sorry. I would take the phone inside and call my uncle to come home. I stepped up to the table, took the phone, quickly assessing it, and tugged on the cord that plugged it into the wall. Yes, it should be long enough to take inside. I picked the whole thing up and looked up. He was standing there wearing a clown-like grinning mask, knife in hand. I don't think I need to tell you it was the most stomach-dropping, terrifying moment. The shock and fright felt like something had just smacked me in the face. I couldn't scream, I dropped the phone and just leapt back to the door, slamming it into Adam and Hamish as I did so. All three of us banged the door shut. Adam and Hamish stood leaning against the door, and I dragged my bed in an adrenaline-fueled frenzy. There was no lock on the door. Would the bed be strong and heavy enough to hold it? I began piling everything I could onto the bed to make it even heavier. Adam and Hamish wordlessly joined in. The books on the bookshelf, all my bags, my suitcase, my clothes, the clock, everything. And then we all sat down on the bed, clambering onto it, leaning against the upper part of the door to make sure it wouldn't open. Now that we're all still, we could just look at each other. Adam began to cry. He was bawling in a thin, whiny voice. Oh my God, we're gonna die, he wailed. No, no, we're not gonna die, I said, though my heart was still pounding painfully against my chest, and I felt like I was gonna be sick. Hamish was just sitting quietly next to me, his little hands folded across his chest. We're gonna die, Adam said again. I told them to calm down, I thought about what we could do. We couldn't stay here forever. We could just wait until he leaves. I don't think I'll ever forget the image. Little Hamish, three years old, sitting next to me looking solemn. His legs out in front of him, clad in those little jeans, with his hands clasped in his lap. His back leaning against the door. And Adam on the other side of me, his knees pulled up to his chest, 
tears streaming down his face, making whimpering noises. All of us in a row barricaded against the door, and we could hear footsteps in the corridor occasionally. The time pressed on, but our tension didn't wane. With every passing second, we expected to hear a thud on the door, and the man trying to get in. Thankfully, it didn't happen. We eventually heard my aunt come in, talking in the corridor, wondering where we were and calling us. It was amazing, but there was a tinge of dread in case the man was still in the apartment, in case he might attack her. Hastily running outside, we told her what happened and searched the place, emboldened by the presence of an adult, but there was no sight of the man. The frustrating thing was, though my uncle and aunt, when they got home from work, didn't believe us at all, she thought we were flat out lying for entertainment, which I found particularly undermining, given that at 12 years old, and mature enough for my age, I would never make something up as serious as that. First she laughed and rolled her eyes, waving us away when we persisted and repeated insisting it did really happen and that we were telling the truth. She eventually grew tired and told us to stop. I still find it astonishing how lightly they can take the complaints of children. We were shaken up for the rest of the day and feeling very indignant and having been just shooed away after something so terrifying had happened. When my parents got back, we told them and it was some solace that they did indeed take us seriously. They knew that it was completely out of character for me to dream up or lie about something like that. My aunt and uncle, however, still didn't agree. Later in the evening, after we were getting ready to go out to dinner, we heard my aunt cry out in surprise, and my uncle rushed to see what happened. It turns out all of her jewellery was gone, and that was when they finally did indeed believe that we had been telling the truth and there was an intruder. Ever since my childhood, it has been the family knowledge and joke, or inside secret, that there is a ghost of a witch living in my maternal grandmother's upstairs level. My older cousin, who is now in her thirties, claims she remembers seeing the ghost of the witch as a child, and from then on, even to this day, is still petrified of the stairwell and will not go up it for any reason. My slightly older cousin, who is now 20, says she has been terrified with the stories of seeing the witch for years, but she, like myself, was slightly more curious about it. A few years younger, I was raised with the same tales. She and I used to climb the stairs at night with all the lights out in hopes of being able to confront the ghost witch. It had all started with my grandmother some time in the 80s. My grandmother, my mother and her siblings, and my late grandfather moved into this two-story house in the early 80s. The house was under new construction when they purchased the house. My mother often boasts about how she was the one who picked the house. She was a child at the time, and she thought the unfinished house was beautiful. My grandmother and grandfather considered her opinion and gave it a look and ended up purchasing it. My grandmother has always been a person who believes in the paranormal. In her younger days, she played around with stuff like tarot and Ouija boards, but was never avid about it, just light stuff. Her interest in such things though, spawned from learning about the heritage of the females in our family. They had been witches killed during the Salem witch trials. In fact, one of the very last witch hangings was held about five minutes from my current home. My grandmother's mother was always accused by the whole family of being a witch. This accusation may have had something to do with the fact that she was heavily abusive to my grandmother when she was young, fed her rat poison, beat the crap out of her on her wedding night, and constantly emotionally abused her. It has always been believed that her house was cursed. I only met this wicked woman about three times, and there was always something off about her. She could convince you that she was the sweetest old woman in the world, and hide how she abused her daughter and her husband. 
Naturally, when my grandmother found out we were descendants from witches, she considered the possibility of her mother being one more seriously. My grandmother moved her Ouija board and her tarot cards and her books about ghosts into the new house in the 80s. And only after a year or so did strange things begin to happen. My mother and grandmother both remember the first occasion of something strange. My grandmother was carrying a laundry basket up the stairs, and suddenly she could no longer continue up. She said that it was feeling like someone was standing in front of her, forceful as a wall and not allowing her to continue. She physically could not continue up the stairs, and she said that the force felt cold and hot at the same time. My mother says she remembers my grandmother trying her hardest to push against it, but not being allowed through. My grandmother calmly said, All right, let me through. And the force disappeared. It terrified my mother, and she said it was chilling how calm my grandmother was about it. My grandmother would often have her girlfriends over for tea at her house, as it's rather large, with two living rooms and decorative old-fashioned charm. It's similar to a small mansion, and she has quite a collection of tea and antique pots and cups. One tea party in the afternoon, though, would be the first visual sighting of the ghost of the witch. She was having tea with a few of her friends, all ladies, when one of the ladies looked up and over to my grandmother's shoulder. She smiled at something behind her, and returned her eyes to my grandmother and asked, Who's your other guest? I've never met her. My grandmother thought someone else had showed up, but she'd not invited anyone else. She turned around and saw that nothing was there. Her friends then began convincing my grandmother that they weren't crazy. They'd all seen her and described her as an old lady, with long, wavy grey hair that's messy, in a dirty dress with the saddest, most confused-looking expression on her face. Though she found it quite interesting, and she did believe her friends, she remained calm about this experience as well. Those girlfriends of hers suddenly no wanted to come over to her house anymore. My grandfather passed away, and several years later my grandmother remarried. Neither of them ever experienced anything, or felt off in the house. None of the men who ever rented the house felt or saw anything at all, and some of the men are skeptics and some are believers. But regardless, none of them saw anything. It seemed the ghost of the witch would only present herself to the woman of family or women visitors. Given our heritage, it would make sense. My grandmother, who is still haunted by this ghost witch, has never had an explanation as to why everyone began regarding her as the witch. She simply said that she felt the lady was a witch. My oldest cousin, the one who is now 30, was the second one to visually see this ghostly lady. She was a teenager when she saw it, about to be 20. She was alone in the house on Christmas night, while everyone sat outside in the large garage. The family often sat out there when they smoked and spent hours in there. My cousin claimed that she was going up the stairs to use the bathroom, too embarrassed to use the one on the second floor. She didn't feel like turning the light on, and just carefully walked up, guided by the light of the downstairs Christmas tree. It was then that she said she saw an old woman with a sorrowful expression and long wavy grey hair walk slowly past her at the top of the stairs. She walked her way into the computer room, which was once my mother's bedroom. It's currently, and was when my cousin had her experience, a room full of mirrors and antiques, and my great-grandmother's belongings. My cousin said the old lady walked to that room, and she refused to climb the stairs to investigate. She ran out of the house, crying to her father that there was a ghost. He didn't believe her, and laughed it off. She was plagued with nightmares for the longest time, and currently refuses to go anywhere near the stairwell. After these occasions with the witch, she became a household name, and my older cousin and I were raised on the spooky tales. 
This was one of the many things that has embedded a fascination with the paranormal and the morbid into my mind from a young age. My grandmother would tell only the young ladies of the house these stories, as the men thought she was crazy regardless of their beliefs on the paranormal, simply because they had never seen anything in the house. My grandmother told my older cousin and I the story of the night that one of her taxidermied birds came back to life for a few minutes. My grandmother and her new husband were both avid hunters and went duck hunting often as well as fishing in ponds at night time. They had their best catch stuffed by a taxidermist and placed in a glass box. The stuffed bird sat atop in a cabin in the computer room, the one the witch apparently walked to. She said that she and her husband were asleep one night when they were startled awake by a loud sound. The sound was of hundreds of birds chirping and screeching and flying. They thought that some birds had hatched in their attic and gotten stuck inside, so that was the first place she checked. Nothing was inside. Though not a single bird, the sound continued and it seemed to be coming from no specific place. She couldn't locate the sound, so she went to open the computer room door, and when she did, deafening silence fell all over the house, and not a single chirp could be heard. She found the taxidermy bird on the floor, the glass box busted into tiny crystals on the floor. This story and the infamous witch story led my curious cousin and I to venture into the computer room as many times as we could. My oldest cousin called us crazy, but we were curious and brave. We only liked to go up at night because it created a better ambience and we felt like we had a better chance of seeing something terrifying for ourselves. We played with antique mirrors, dug through old wooden trunks in search of my grandmother's Ouija board, and did ghost chants and witch spells that we found online. When that got boring and came with no results, we got on Microsoft Word and wrote murder mystery stories. We'd write the most gore-filled story we could imagine and then print it out on my grandmother's printer and hide several copies of it around the house to creep people out. Sometimes the very old desktop computer would take control of itself and start searching for things on its own. We witnessed it type in a series of confusing codes and numbers and then pull up various pictures of headstones and scroll quickly through them. We didn't scream and run out as our oldest cousin would have. We simply watched in silence the computer abruptly shutting off, and our only fear was that we would get in trouble for breaking my grandmother's computer. The lights would turn on and off in the room, not as if flickering though. They turned off and on dutifully, as if someone was doing it on purpose. Strange sounds came from the floor, like scratching and bumping, and the mirror always seemed to be in a different spot every time we turned around to look at it. Books fell off shelves, and the other, newer computer, kept on the other side of the room would fire up by itself. Before my older cousin and I could ever really delve into the witch story, she grew up. She was only a few years older than me, but her interest turned to boys and being popular in school. She had her first slide phone and stopped paying me any attention at all. We'd once been so close, but her own social standards forced us apart, and she rarely spoke to me. She was rarely mean to me, but she acknowledged me only on holidays. She evolved into a preppy popular girl while I spiralled into a paranormal obsessed young teenager who scoured the internet for gore and the supernatural. And I still ventured on my own now, into that computer room upstairs. My fascination for the paranormal was far deeper than that of my cousins. Hers had just been a phase. Mine has been my entire life. Both sides of my family believe in ghosts, and each have stories of their own experiences. The only skeptic, surprisingly, is my mother. She does admit, though, that she only doesn't believe because she tries not to, because she's scared to. My father, on the other hand, was my biggest supplier of creepy stories, and he always told me, if you go looking for something, 
you'll find it sooner or later. Because he knew how badly I wanted to explore ghosts, so I never stopped looking in my grandmother's house. My great-grandmother, nearly 102 years old at the time, was placed in a nursing home because her house couldn't be afforded and all the money was going into the nursing home and the house to the state. There was an occasion where the family was invited to go collect some things from her house, anything that we liked, because they were going to get thrown away. I went and took some creepy old dolls from the 20s and my mother took some sentimental items. When I was in my great grandmother's bedroom alone, staring into the large Victorian mirror of hers, chills rushed through me, and I leaped when I saw a shadow dart behind me. I turned around and searched for what had made the shadow, but a strong smell of garlic and burning wood dizzled me and forced me to leave the room. The presence felt sad and angry at the same time. My aunt, who had more business knowledge than any of us at the time, was helping my grandmother close the probate on the house. It was her job to keep the house in good condition, so she had to visit it alone frequently. On the last day of having to go inside, she went in to take the items that she wanted from the estate, a vintage lamp that reminded her of her 70s childhood. She took the lamp and bid the house and relieved farewell. She locked it up behind her, and suddenly a massive bolt of lightning struck the yard just in front of her. The rain began to pour and the wind began to howl, blackened clouds bruising the sky above her, making a great rage of a storm. She quickly tried to unlock the house, but the keys seemed to not even fit the doorknob anymore. The door opened on its own accord after she pulled the key away, and she ran inside to shelter from the rain and sat the lamp down. She claims she saw something run through the kitchen from the corner of her eye, and with the witch rumours about her wicked grandmother, decided to leave the lamp. She closed the door behind her, leaving the lamp, and when she stepped out onto the front porch, the rain had stopped, and there wasn't even a breeze, not a cloud in the sky. She still claims to this day that her grandmother's house was cursed. A few years later, my great-grandmother died. I attended the funeral, and my family made jokes the whole time. My grandmother was hardly sad that this day had come, as she had had to take care of the wicked woman who abused her, and she took care of her about everything she needed every day from her 70th birthday until her death at 102. She was relieved and when the funeral home workers apologized and gave condolences, we all looked at each other. My aunt stepping out of the restroom while the big ivory casket was being rolled into the chapel, accidentally whacked it with the door and nearly knocked it over, killing us all as we struggled not to burst into laughter. It was the most humorous funeral we'd ever attended. After her death, my grandmother was plagued with nightmares of her mother coming back to haunt her, or being trapped with her in the afterlife. One night, she found her husband walking around the house, shotgun in hand. She asked him what he was doing, and he looked terrified. This was the first occasion when a man in the house had experienced something paranormal. He was shaking, and he shouted to my grandmother, Your mother is here. She begged him to explain what he was talking about, and he said, I smell her. I feel her. She's here. Don't you smell that? Her mother had always worn the same perfume. Elizabeth Taylor's white diamonds. It was the only perfume she'd ever worn, and she spritzed it on herself heavily every day, sometimes twice a day. It was a scent that had sickened my grandmother's husband for the whole time he'd known the old lady. My grandmother recently tried to give us some of her mother's old jewellery because she wanted it out of the house so badly. She claimed it was cursed, and I believed her. My aunt certainly believed her, and my older cousin, though so long separated from our experiences as a child, refused to take the jewellery. I thought of taking it, but I already owned a piece of jewellery that was passed down through the women of our family through all the witches. It's a sapphire ring that saw several generations 
and for some reason I find that more coincidental that it ended up with me. After my great grandmother gave it to my grandmother, she gave it to my mother before I was born and said, give this to her. My mother didn't even know she was having a girl yet, and she asked her mother how she could assume I was a girl, and my grandmother simply said, just give this to her. And well, here I am, a very paranormal type of girl wearing the witchy sapphire ring today. I haven't seen my older cousin in several years. The last time I saw her was at someone's funeral. She's a drug addict and she moved far away. My older cousin got married and moved away and hasn't given the paranormal a second thought. It seems now that her memories have been completely erased when the topic of the witch and the computer room are brought up. It's as if she's a different person. My grandmother's friends never came around anymore and whether they admit it or not, it's because of that ghostly witch. My mother thinks that my grandmother and I are crazy, but it seems we simply are more sensitive to these types of things. Recently, my grandmother said that she was in a store when a short, polite old woman approached her. She was in all white robes and she was shockingly pale, but she was friendly and exuded calm and happiness. She asked my grandmother to direct her to the exit, and she couldn't find it. When she was about to tell her where the exit was, the glowing white woman disappeared into thin air. Nobody believes me but her. I now have my own Ouija board, tarot cards, crystals, mirrors and antique objects and dolls, as well as a dowsing rod, EMF meter and EVP reader. For about three years I've obsessively tried to contact one particular ghost, and it wouldn't surprise me if I open the doors to something else in the meantime, especially when considering the lengths I've gone to. I still try to contact this particular ghost, and for now, he only reaches out to me in my dreams. But if you go looking for long enough, I'm sure you're bound to find something. Some stuff happened to me, but most of this happened to my brother. Really, the most that happened to me was that if I left the basement, like watching television to grab a snack, I would return and certain things would be out of place. For example, television remotes, dishes that would be left down there. Sometimes the remotes were 10 feet away from where they should be. And every time I'd go to my family to see if they had tampered with anything, the answer would always be no. Sometimes I would hear my name being called out, but dismissed that easily, because I could have been hearing things. I didn't worry about this all too much, because there were no worries behind it. I was always just dismissing it. Now here was where all the freaky stuff begins. My brother always told me stories of him hearing things, like his voice being called by my parents at 3am. The two biggest events that happened to him were one when he was sitting playing video games in his room in the basement, and there's a sort of hallway slash pool room that is before you enter his. While he was enjoying himself, on his right shoulder, he got really cold and he made efforts to warm it back up, but it wasn't working. And when he swiveled his chair to the right and looked into the mirror, there he was facing the door, and he saw a shadow dart in or out of his room. And then on another time, he was hearing things outside of his room. So he gets up, goes to the bathroom, comes out, and he's growling behind our pool table. We do not have dogs. He craps himself and runs into his room and locks it. Shortly after he locks it, his door handle jiggles for about 30 seconds and then stops. Weirdly though, I am not that afraid of my basement. But at night, I do not enjoy being down there alone. I grew up in a very rural area in the Appalachians. There was no town for half an hour or longer drive in any direction. 
no traffic lights, just back roads and terrifying houses, and a lot of forest. I grew up without limited electricity, water, and all of that jazz, as did most of the people around me. We had a set of well-off retirees move in pretty close to my house on the opposite side of the mountain. They built a fancy house on the other side of the mountain and had a good long winding one mile long driveway from the main mountain road. I knew the neighbors simply as Steve and Joanne. Steve and Joanne ended up getting custody of three of their grandchildren when I was about three years old and they were very young and had developmental delays. One was deaf, one was a quadriplegic, and the youngest, Jonathan, and not exactly sure what was wrong with him, but he was slow, wore a helmet and that kind of thing. But I was too little to know. Since we lived in an old unsettled territory where there is a ton of exposed wells from old foundations and cabins, my dad was always very cautious about where I played because of the danger of them. And despite Steve and Joanne's precautions, and no one apparently knows how, Jonathan got outside one day, wandered out into the woods, and fell in one of those wells. It happened to be one that had water in it, and he drowned. I was around five years old, and I remember hearing when the cops found his body, that he had drowned, and how inconceivable that was to me as a kid. I went to the funeral as well, and after this, the family built a large, gated deck around the house that was airtight to protect the kids just in case. It was a huge project, and an absolutely gigantic locked gate. My mum hung out with the family pretty often, so I was dragged over there for quite a few years until I was eight or so. She would do work for them, like clean their house or milk their goats. And I just wandered on the creepy deck on the side of the mountain and felt very unsettled. I got those feelings a lot as a kid. And to tell the truth, I had forgotten about the little boy who died. But anyway, I just remember being in the house and hating it there. Then one day, Steve and Joanne just up and left. They left everything and moved to Alaska. That was the rumor anyway but the house sat empty. I used to see the house through the woods when I was out exploring, and I remember it because none of my dogs would ever go towards the house at all. I could sometimes hear these loud scrapes and booms. Think of a sound that a tin sheet would make if you stomped on it, and it felt like the empty house was looking back at me. I attributed the sound to bears or deers or other loud animals and avoided it. One day I was about 10 years old and saw an old truck peel into the driveway. I alerted my father who grabbed his gun and jumped into his truck. He's a pretty aggressive paranoid mountain man and he followed the truck up and when he returned I asked him who it was and he refused to talk to me. But sneaky me pretended to play outside but was actually outside the window listening as he told my mum what happened. The men in the other truck were two of Steve's sons. They had told my dad they were there to get one final look at the house that they helped build because it was being sold. And they apparently asked my dad if he had ever gotten a weird feeling from the house. My dad said no. And as he explained it to my mom, he said while they were out there helping build that deck that they heard the sound of kids running around the planks. And at one time he saw a shadow fall over his back and the shadow was a young kid wearing a helmet. This absolutely petrified me and I never told anyone what I heard. Fast forward a few years. When I was 12 I got really into horseback riding. However after a few months of near misses from idiotic speeding drivers on the road my dad had enough and banned me to mountain trail riding only. In his opinion, it was safer. I would have agreed at this point if he would have let me carry a knife or gun. The most convenient trail was the mile long dirt driveway to the abandoned house. Fair enough. I didn't have to ride the whole driveway and see the house. 
I could just go back and forth along the winding road and turn back before I reached the end of the driveway. So one day I was doing this and got braver and braver. Eventually I decided I would ride my horse up to the last turn, which was level with the house and where everyone parked their cars. I guess I was curious and just wanted to see this place up close now, as it had gotten dilapidated and the grand deck was looking pretty moldy. The driveway end was all overgrown, which my horse was really excited about. We were doing walks and trots for a good hour or two. His name was Tennessee. He was all sweaty and wet, and we walked up to the end of the driveway and immediately went for the tall grass, dipping his head down to about knee level to reach it nibbling away. I know I was going to be in trouble for letting him eat grass, but I had to mention before anything else that this horse was not skittish. He was middle-aged and had been rodeo trick horse trained and was not afraid of wimpy horse scary things like loud noises or cars. He was intelligent and definitely the best trained animal I'd ever owned. He could even rear in a circle on his hind legs. It's one of those rodeo tricks. In any case, we were there for a good five minutes the air was still, the day was hot, and the sun was shining. I was staring ahead. The house was to my right, and the horse and I were perpendicular to it. Down the mountain and just zoning out. I admit that I felt watched, like I always did when I was near the house. But since I felt that way 99% of the time as a kid, it was easily ignored. But then, I heard running footsteps in the empty house. I turned my head to look, and when I did, I got this insane feeling of dread. I half expected a bear to rush at me. The worst part is, just as this feeling hit me, my horse abruptly stopped his chewing and tensed up. I could feel it. His head shot to the right as well as his ears pointing forwards. That's when I internally went, oh shit because the confirmation from my horse was that this whole thing was real. We stared at the house in unison, footsteps getting stronger, and the feeling of dread gradually getting worse. And then suddenly, a scraping noise like metal on metal. There was a huge swamp cooler in the large kitchen window, which got pulled inside as we stood there. I saw it wiggle and bang. It fell and all the doors and windows shook. Whatever had been walking inside lifted this immensely huge thing and pushed it inwards because it wouldn't push outwards. When the swamp cooler disappeared, my horse straight up bolted. He had never done that before or since, even after being near gunshots and wild boars, but he took off in a dead run and I just let him go. I was absolutely terrified and I remember hearing his hooves thundering along the dirt and gravel and hearing the wind and my own heartbeat and just this ungodly roaring, almost like a lion or a bear. Anyway, that's the story. Make of it what you will. I very slyly told my dad that I had seen the swamp cooler missing from the window and he went over to check and said the house had been ransacked but nothing was stolen. He said it was human. There were no evidence of animals being inside, but the cabinets were opened and the food and belongings were thrown around. He was angry thinking it was a vandal, but he said all the doors were locked and the windows intact. For context, I'm terrified of planes. In sixth grade, my school invited me and some friends for a trip to another state. The thing is, we had to go by plane. The trip was great, but the day we were supposed to return, there was a giant storm going on. The plane took off regardless. And let me tell you, kid me almost had a stroke. Not only was it shaking a lot, people weren't calm. Everyone was basically going insane and ready to give up on life. To make matters worse, for some unknown reason, 
we had to go back. I thought it's because we were going to perish in the storm. We returned to the airport and I phoned my family and started crying so much that I basically wanted someone to go over to that state by car to pick me up and it's a five day ride. Later we found out that a piece of ice hit the pilot's window, cracking it, making us return to the airport. I was terrified and that left a scar on my mind. Now, whenever I enter a plane, I remind myself of what happened. Thankfully, on the day after, and not being able to sleep in the hotel because I was too scared, the two flights we had to take went fine, and I returned home safely. I do sanctuary work at festivals and burns. For those unfamiliar, sanctuary spaces are these events generally refer to encampments that are set up specifically for people who are not a medical risk or an immediate security risk, but have probably eaten way too many psychedelic drugs and need someone to keep an eye on them and be nice to them for a few hours. It may involve allowing them to talk through some difficult stuff, going to town on a colouring book, or just providing a comforting silent presence. Trip sitting can be a thoroughly rewarding experience. The team I work with sets up a large, elegant dome tent at events that is open for anyone who needs a break from the festival environment which can obviously be overstimulating at times. We also usually have a few smaller tents intended for people who may need to be escalated and not too keen on being around groups. However, on the weekend in question, we grossly underestimated attendance numbers and did not bring the small tents. This will be an important detail later on. I was assigned to the late night shift, 4am to 8am, on both the Friday night and Saturday night of the festival. There was a small and low key crowd in the tent on Friday night, mainly folks just chilling and talking quietly, appreciating the music in the distance, and I took a brief note of one fellow in there, who seemed ordinary enough. He wasn't speaking and his eyes were quite enlarged, but that is not out of the ordinary for guests. He appeared content keeping to himself, so I didn't interact with him much. For some reason, I had recurring thoughts about the guy the next day. It was a small festival and I saw him walking around a few times with those same dilated eyes and tightly clenched jaw, always by himself. Now this isn't necessarily a red flag at the time, except this happened to be a festival where a lot of people knew each other, and the telltale signs of tripping tend to wear off after about eight hours. Each time I noticed him, I grew increasingly uneasy, but dismissed it as irrational paranoia and went about my fun. Saturday night rolls around, and I was excited to catch the set of a DJ I liked before my next sanctuary shift. As I was boogieing, I saw the bug-eyed dude about 10 feet away, staring straight ahead, with that same static expression and thousand yard stare. Irrational or not, I felt the need to create more distance between us and quickly moved to a different part of the crowd. No sooner had I done that and resumed my dancing, did I look to my left and there he was, now five inches from my face, eyes like saucers exclaiming, hi. I was so startled that I booked it away from the stage area and thankfully bumped into a friend who helped me laugh it off. 4am rolls around, and I'm sharing this story with my co-staff, whom I consider good friends and colleagues. 
The person in question is called G-Man. And not a minute after I finish recounting my what a creeper anecdote, a golf cart rolls up like clockwork. And out of it steps guess who googly eyes. Normally our golf cart transport comes to us via the medics or security team and they'll fill us in on what they can about the person who needs the help. But whoever was driving this one unceremoniously dumps this weirdo into our care and speeds off into the night without another word. I silently signal that this is the guy I had been talking about and G-Man takes charge. For reference, I'm a woman so it would have been more appropriate for G-Man to do so even without the pre-context. Googly Eyes says he needs to use the bathroom, so G-Man escorts him to the Porter John's, only to come back alone 10 minutes later. Turns out that Googly Eyed Man was making lewd comments to the women in line for the Porter John's, and when G-Man tried to gently redirect him, he decided he was tired of male company and told him to piss off. We never force people to stay at the sanctuary and G-Man was visibly irritated by the encounter, so it seemed for the best. Case closed. Right? We decided to check in with one of our homies in security just for due diligence and it turns out they'd already spoken with the dude. I can't recall why, but it was for a minor infraction. The moment our conversations wrap up, two things happen at once. One, a couple of my friends arrive escorting a young, half-nude woman to the tent, so I immediately spring to action. And two, our friend Googly Eyes takes this opportunity to reappear out the darkness like damn Beetlejuice. He hasn't done anything severe enough for us to ban him from the sanctuary since we deal with people in altered states, the threshold for bizarre behavior is very high. But as I mentioned earlier, we were also lacking from the privacy of our smaller tents. The young woman probably would have benefited from some time in one anyway, given her condition, but I particularly didn't want googly eyes anywhere near her. With both of them now here in the same sanctuary space, I did my best to create a physical boundary discreetly as possible. My two friends, both female, stayed with us for a little bit, while trying to make her feel at ease. She was alert, but non-verbal, and had been distressed and distorted when they found her. Googly eyes immediately starts inching closer to us, intermittently butting into our conversation, his tense jaw stretched into an unsettling grimace. I can practically feel him eyeing all of us up, especially the girl we were trying to take care of, who was still rather exposed from the waist up. At this point to G-Man and our shift leader, who had been roaming around the grounds until then, who we'll call B-Money, and another male team member who was off shift but hanging out in the space, are there. G-Man, who has an eye on the situation, but can't do a whole lot at this point because googly eyes has already flared up at him and intervening could have exasperated matters. Nevertheless, I'd had enough of him for the night and quietly go over and tell the guys that I'm uncomfortable. B Money is a pro at this kind of work and immediately develops a plan. He approaches googly eyes and gives him a series of odd tasks. Hey man, can you inspect this rock for me? Hi friend, can you watch this sage stick? Googly Eyes is clearly struggling with these complicated instructions and asks B Money to leave him alone. B Money says, that's fine dude, no worries. But first, can you arrange these colored pencils? At last, Googly Eyes gets flustered and huffs off and every muscle in my body relaxes. We have a lovely remainder of our shift chatting and doing art until the sun comes up. We even get our other guests to laugh a little bit. And by dawn, she is able to talk and walk back to her campsite independently. Sunday fun day on the last day of the festival is magical, but I'm wrecked by afternoon 
and drive home to decompress. The word on Facebook come Monday is that someone was taken into custody by local law enforcement on Sunday evening in connection with some thefts that had been taking place over the weekend. But I didn't get the full story until a couple of weeks later when a team member of ours does a debrief. Turns out that a number of tickets had been hustled and sold at a discount to locals near the festival property, which happens to be in an area of the rural south, where you paddle extra fast if you hear banjos. In other words, some tickets wound up in the hands of folks who were not there for the music or the yoga worship. One of our team members had to run off to some Duck Dynasty extras who showed up at our sanctuary looking to get some, demanding to know where them topless women were at. If you haven't already guessed, one of those discounted ticket holders happened to be Googly Eyes, who also turned out to be the guy that got arrested for some of the robberies. Once apprehended by festival security and turned over to county police, they also discovered that he was on meth, hence the eyes and jaw, and was in possession of a handgun, presumably the whole time he was lurking in the sanctuary. Googly-eyed man, get your stuff together. Let's never meet again. In 1988, I quit my job as a teacher in San Francisco and moved back with my parents in East Sacramento, in their guest house. It was a nice little cabin type with a small sitting area near the kitchenette and the sound of shrubbery near my bedroom was relaxing. During the summer, I was taking a refresher course in alternative teaching methods in a nearby town called Rancho Cordova and I was there for most hours of the morning from 9 till 12 and I would take the bus home. It was a really nice place to live and the houses were beautiful. Who wouldn't want to live there? Not me. When I'd walk through Sacramento, I'd imagine walking through the busy streets of the hate. I had to be there so I had no other choice and the teaching job I was doing to have at Folsom Middle School seemed promising. On a sunny afternoon, I walked home from the bus stop and noticed the neighbor's son, at only 10, was sitting on the parent's lawn. I asked him if he was okay and he looked at me dazed. There's a man looking in your window, he said. I thought maybe he'd seen my dad and that was it. I asked him to carry my books while I unlocked the door and told him it was probably my father. No, he was looking from the outside, he said. Once again thinking he was just a kid with an imagination. What did he look like? He said it was a man wearing a black mask like the Hamburglar. This was California, and David had never seen snow. So it's likely he'd never seen a ski mask, and it sounded like that was what he was describing. For a second I considered reporting it, but it was only the basis of a child who said a man who looked like the Hamburglar was looking in my parents' living room window. I let him inside, let him have a soda, and walked him across the street. The rest of the afternoon I sat on the patio of the guest house, smoking cigarettes and reading Stephen King. I lifted my head up to take a sip from my coke when I saw a shadow duck behind the garden shed. It was almost like at the moment when Annie and Laurie are walking home in Halloween and the shape hides behind the hedges. Almost like that. Cigarette in hand, I walk over to the garden shed slowly. David, if that's you, go home. I looked behind and there was no one there. But beside it, there were two footprints where someone wearing heavy boots was standing. I was freaked. But it could have easily been anybody, even the neighbor. I went inside and put on a record really loud, leaving the window open and sitting back on the patio reading my book. I thought if there was someone creeping about, maybe playing music would scare them to thinking someone was home. A knot was tightening in my stomach 
and the more I thought about it, the more I was tempted to look up from my page to see if the shadow would jump out from behind the shed once more. I grew up there and never felt like East Sacramento was a place for prowlers. It seemed too much of a sunshine land for that. I blew the thought off and decided to pick the needle up, turn the stereo off, lock up, and go to an old friend's house until my parents returned home. I went to my cousin Cindy's house. She'd just married her boyfriend straight out of high school. Cindy was a kindred spirit and would go on to marry four more times by 1999 before she had her first son. Call the police, that's what I'd do, she said, rinsing her hair in the sink. she just finished colouring it with food dye. Her husband, Brad, at the time, offered to go over there before he had to go to work at the video store. Brad wasn't butch or strong, but he pretended he was. I felt stupid. A grown-ass adult that was too scared to go home because the bogeyman was hiding in the garden shed. That place always gave me the creeps. It's dark. There's spiders. Cindy laughed. But we never thought there was someone in there, I replied to her. I called my mother at her prayer group and she came to pick me up. I felt even more pathetic than I did before. I told her what I'd seen and what David said. She said that I was scaring myself and to not be silly. She laughed, and I thought perhaps she was right. That was until I came home to find the kitchenette window in the guest house had its screen taken off, put neatly against the wall. Nothing had been taken, but things had been moved. Odd things. Some records were pulled slightly off the shelf. A picture of an old friend had been placed face down and there was an empty beer can in my trash can. I don't drink, and some of the food in my fridge had been eaten. My degree was now on a different hook. Either some jackass broke into my house to move some stuff and have lunch, or I was going crazy. After this, I started getting obscene phone calls like heavy breathing and whispers that I couldn't understand. I asked the police what to do and they told me to put in new locks on the doors and call my phone company to change my number. When I asked them if there was something they could do, they said they couldn't because I had no evidence these things were related and nothing was stolen. I prepared to move and decided I wasn't going to wait around to be the victim of crime. One afternoon I'd come home from work to hear the phone ringing. I dropped my student's work on the outside chair and quickly unlocked the door, picked up the phone and said, Hello? There was nothing. Hello, anybody there? <sighs> they were calling me a whore in this high-pitched whisper. I'd had enough. I moved that weekend in with my cousin Cindy until I could find somewhere else. My parents never experienced the phone calls and never found their things misplaced. For some time I considered it was a student I gave a bad grade or someone following me home. I'd like to know who it was. It'll eat me alive otherwise. I've gone on long enough without knowing. And maybe I will never know. This happened two years ago when I had just finished high school. I was 18 at the time, and I was not the most popular girl in my school. However, I did not go completely unnoticed. I'm mentioning this to you because I'm attractive as a female, and I do work out occasionally. I'm half Hispanic, half Caucasian, have light fair skin and dark black hair. I'm only telling you this so that you have an idea of what I look like. The thing is, I didn't have any friends. I have trust issues, which is a story for another time. I wasn't that close to my family either. So most of my social life and interactions were online. In my social life, I communicated with mostly cute guys in my city. Preferably, I only talked to younger guys and 
if they were not in my city, I didn't reply because I didn't have a car. This also means that when I would go out on dates, these guys would have to pick me up. Most of my dates were nothing serious. It was mostly fun and games, but I did eventually want a relationship. Eventually, I came upon this Facebook message from this guy with a simple greeting. Hi, how are you? He seemed completely normal. He was not the most attractive guy that I would normally go out with, but something about him caught my attention and I couldn't really describe it. You know that feeling when they might feel like they're the one, even if you've never met them. I do believe that I was destined at one point to cross paths with my potential soulmate. So I decided to give this guy a shot. His name was Tyler. And looking at his Facebook profile, he was pretty slender but fit. He had fair white freckled skin, and his hair was ginger, which I also really liked about him. I had a thing for gingers. After reviewing his profile, which I'm sure everyone does before replying to someone they don't know, I decided to respond to Tyler and get to know him a little more. We eventually got into a conversation and we shared some similarities. After a week of conversation, we both decided it was time to meet in person. I was not conflicted about meeting Tyler in person because I had nothing else going on. I was not working yet, and I had just finished high school, so I had a lot of free time on my hands. The day we decided to meet came around, and Tyler already knew about my situation of not having a car, so he had planned on picking me up, and I decided to wear a cute, short black dress with a sweater over it because it was slightly chilly outside and I kept my long black hair straight and wore a little makeup. Sooner than later, the time Tyler was supposed to pick me up was here. It was around 9 p.m., which was the time we agreed he'd come to get me. But Tyler wasn't outside my house yet. He told me that he would be driving a black minivan but I didn't see any black cars outside my house. It was getting late, an hour had passed, and Tyler didn't respond to any of my messages, though I could see they were all red. I was about to call it off when I got a notification from my phone. Tyler said he was finally here. I was annoyed of how long he took to arrive. However, my excitement was stronger so I decided to put my shoes on and head out. Tyler was outside the car and greeted me. I looked at him, and I noticed he was underdressed than I was. He wore an orange hoodie and sweatpants, and I felt a bit embarrassed and thought I should have wore something more comfortable. I walk over to hug him, and he opened the door for me. Before I went inside, though, I noticed that there were two people inside the car, there was a guy in the driver's seat and a female in the passenger seat. Alarms were going off in my head right away, but before I could do anything, Tyler escorted me in the car. Tyler then joins me in the back seat, and I was frightened to say the least, but I didn't know what this was yet, and Tyler never mentioned there would be people joining us. From the moment I got in, I wanted to leave. I noticed Tyler's appearance to be a bit older than he'd looked on Facebook. He was still attractive, but looked tired, like he hadn't slept in a while. He never spoke one word to me inside the car either, which made me feel uneasy. All he did was wink at me several times on the ride, wherever we were going. We eventually pulled up to a motel, and I had an idea where this was going, but wasn't sure yet. Everyone got out the car, and I was the last to leave. The others started to make their way to the motel, and Tyler grabbed my hand and made our way behind them. When we got inside the motel room, I noticed right away a girl passed out on the bed. I knew she was just sleeping though. 
Everyone got settled into the room, and I did my best to play along because I did not want to give off a vibe that alarmed everyone that would be trouble. As soon as a conversation was going, I found out that the girl from the passenger seat was Tyler's sister. She had glasses and was slightly overweight, and she looked a bit like Tyler. She also hadn't slept in days. Her name was Shelby. And I think the guy driving was the boyfriend of the girl asleep on the bed, as he was trying to tell us to be quiet. Tyler was still looking at me with these predatory eyes, like he hadn't been with a woman in a while. And Shelby was talking with the other guy, who I didn't know the name of yet. It was not soon after that I realized I was in trouble. I saw drugs being taken out of a bag that they had on them, with more drugs hidden around the motel room. I knew it would be more difficult to get out of this situation now, but I had to keep a brave face on because if I showed any signs of weakness, I'd be done for. Throughout this entire time being here, which felt like hours, Tyler eventually looked away from me to take out this glass pipe and a lighter. I could only describe this substance he was smoking to be meth. I'd never done drugs before, so I was frightened by the sight but kept a cool face. I was quiet the entire time. And then the other guy caught on because he asked Tyler why I was so quiet. Tyler shrugged and then asked me the dreaded question. Would you like to smoke this, babe? I didn't know how to respond to that. I was shocked and scared. My mind began racing with so many thoughts. It took me a few short seconds to say, yeah, sure, thanks, babe. I decided to play this out as smartly as I could. I thought if I played along, I could sneak out somehow while everyone was caught off guard. Besides, in a situation like this, you have to think on your feet and be smart. If I'd have said no, I can imagine different scenarios of me not making it through the night. So playing this out, I waited for Tyler to finish smoking the pipe until it was my turn. After watching him for a few seconds, it was my turn. Tyler passed me the pipe. I hesitantly lit it and began to inhale the smoke. I wasn't sure if I did it right, but didn't care. I must not have smoked enough though, because Tyler continually persisted me to take longer breaths. He walked over towards me and held the pipe for me so I could try it again. I coughed the first several times and the others looked at me. They must have noticed that it was my first time doing this, but I hoped that they would think it had been a while for me. Tyler took the pipe after I was done so that he could continue. And it wasn't soon after that I began to feel lightheaded. I was starting to feel symptoms I'd never experienced before. My heart began racing faster, and my vision began to widen, as I could now notice little details in the room that I couldn't before. I had butterflies in my stomach, but not the bad kind. I meant the really good kind, when you're experiencing your first kiss and the fireworks. I felt amazing, and that scared me. I wanted to leave then, but I had to keep my composure. It was really hard now, because they enhanced my fear and paranoia. Sitting the entire time there didn't make the situation any easier. Tyler then said to me, Hey babe, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I just have to use the bathroom. I didn't really have to use it. I just had to move around. I didn't know if it would be what I had taken or myself, or both. Tyler walked me over and led me to the bathroom at the end of the room, which was next to the door outside the motel. I thanked him and walked in, and attempted to lock the bathroom by first instinct, but there was no lock. I panicked a little and tried to think a way out of this little motel room. Suddenly, an idea. I could fake a phone call from someone I knew off my Facebook Messenger and see who was online. Maybe they could pick me up and get me out of here. It was the best idea in my head, so I went along with it and proceeded to pester anyone I knew who I thought could take me home. I asked several guys who seemed nice enough with the same message 
explaining a short version of the situation. Most of them responded with, call 911. Some didn't answer. Luckily though, a very sweet guy responded to me, asking for my location. I didn't hesitate, and sent him my location straight away. His name was Kyle, and he looked around the same age as me, so I felt safe. After sending him my location, he sent me a message saying that he'd be there in five minutes. I was very happy that he wasn't that far, and I replied to his message, saying thank you. I wasn't sure if I knew Kyle personally, but he did seem familiar. All I know is I had to find someone in my city on my Facebook friends list who was online and could somehow take me away from these junkies. And I did. So that was taken care of. Now all I had to do was find a way to explain to Tyler why I had to leave. I flushed the bathroom toilet and even though I didn't use it, I washed my hands. I exited and noticed Shelby and the guy leaving the room. I saw Tyler continue to smoke the glass pipe, walked over to him and took the time to think of a reason to tell him why I had to leave as he continued smoking. Thinking fast on my feet, I thought of stupid explanations to escape. After he finished his pipe, he looked at me and said, Feeling all better, baby. You took a while, so I got worried. My sister and Vince went to grab snacks for us, so they left really quick to the gas station. I replied back saying, Sorry about that, just been having lady problems. And is that the guy's name, Vince? Yeah, that's Vince. He's stolen from us before, so we're hanging out with him, pretending to like him. I hesitantly replied, asking, Oh, what did he steal from you? He stole my sister's car and never returned it. So we're keeping him real close. You know what I'm saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I chuckled to Tyler softly, pretending to agree with him. I then had a bright idea to make an excuse to leave. Hey Tyler, I have to check on my big brother. He said he'd be picking me up tonight and I have to see when he's coming to get me. He looked annoyed when I told him this, but I didn't care. I went on my phone and tried to call Kyle, who I messaged earlier, and he picked up after the first ring and told me he was there. I told him I'd be two minutes. I walked back over to Tyler, made an excuse how he's earlier than expected, and why I had to go. He stood up, glass pipe in hand, and told me that I wasn't leaving. I felt sick. As he said that, I wanted to throw up. I kept my composure, however, because I didn't think he would hurt me with someone else in the room, even if that person was a petite and passed out. I firmly told him, Okay, let me run downstairs to the parking lot and tell him that I'm fine staying with you tonight. I grabbed his hand as I said this in the hopes that he would believe the lie. He looked conflicted about what I was saying, but agreed to let me walk outside to my fake brother Kyle from Facebook who was saving me. Tyler watched me walk outside the motel room and I could feel his eyes piercing behind my back. Even though I couldn't see him, I definitely felt it. I glanced behind me when I was going down the stairs to the parking lot to see if I was being followed. Fortunately, he wasn't. So I took that opportunity and dashed to find Carl's car. I didn't care if he heard me running to the parking lot in front of the motel as fast as I could, but then I panicked. I never asked Kyle which kind of car he drove. So I looked at every car until I saw anyone with their lights on. I then saw a car drive up to me, stop and roll down their window. It was Kyle. He opened the passenger seat and I immediately got inside. He looked worried, but I told him to just drive out of there. And he agreed. He seemed spooked by my reaction and I didn't seem to like the area I was in either. So he drove out of there in a flash. But with my adrenaline acting like crazy, and paranoia from what I'd been taking, I kept glancing behind me, making sure we weren't being followed. But Kyle assured me we were safe. Eventually, I felt safe enough and told Kyle everything. He looked shocked by my responses and he told me he was glad he could help me out. I 
told him again how grateful I was that he was there to pick me up. And he explained to me that he was glad to help a lady out if someone needed it. It was then that I found out Kyle wasn't just a stranger, but he was a date that I had went out on a while ago from the Plenty of Fish dating app. Kyle was also a soldier who lived on a base in my area, and that made me feel safe. Once he arrived at my home, he told me to be careful with who I met up with. I hugged him, thanked him, and blocked Tyler on Facebook. I wasn't worried about Tyler knowing where I lived, because at the time a sheriff lived across from me, and Tyler knew about it too, because when he came to pick me up earlier that night, he looked around the neighborhood to see a sheriff's car across from my house. But the sheriff's car's lights weren't on, of course, which is why Tyler probably didn't get spooked right off the bat. But he did ask me earlier that night if I was the sheriff's daughter later on in the motel room. Only now do I wish I'd had said yes. I was always cautious from time to time living in my neighborhood because he did know my address and it wasn't until I moved that I felt safe again. To this day, I'm always careful of who I meet up with and where I'm going. And to Tyler and his junky pals, get help and let's not meet again. A friend of mine got a new house. He got a really good deal. It was about $100,000 or something. Really good for a small house. As soon as he moved in, something was off. He lived there with his girlfriend. The first encounter with the noises was when they were inside the house moving in. My friend was going up to the attic to store some extra stuff that wouldn't fit to pawn later. As he was going up the ladder, he heard a scrambling noise. He went up and a terrible smell hit him. It was a 20 year old house and he thought nothing of it. After he went down, he heard something in the attic. He figured it was a rodent and after a few weeks called an exterminator. The exterminator went up and found a bunch of coke, heroin and every narcotic you can think of just sitting there. He called the police and they arrived and searched the house. My friend was cuffed the house was searched, and in the attic, they found a pipe in the corner leading to the crawl space. They didn't have a crawl space as far as they knew. The cops went back down and searched the house. They eventually found nothing, and my friend took it upon himself to break the base underneath the house. He found a living space with his stuff from the attic and a guy with long brown hair and a torn hoodie, and my friend's extra shoes. He yelled for the cops, still out front, and got the hell out of there. The cops wanted the man to put his gun down, and he did, and they told him to get in cuffs. He walked over to the hole my friend had broke and accepted fate. He was charged with illegal drug trafficking and sentenced to a year in prison. It still creeps out my friend, even though he moved the hell away from there a few months ago, to know that some drug dealer was hiding in his house for months with a gun.